the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability <coughs> is now in session. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is the third day of Public Hearing 27, which is examining conditions in detention in the uh, criminal justice system for people uh, with disability. Uh, we've commenced uh, with the acknowledgement of country, and I'll ask uh, Commissioner Mason to make the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Chair. Kaya, we acknowledge the Wajak Nyunga people as the original inhabitants and traditional owners of the lands in which we gather today, Wajak, and where is where the city of Perth is situated. We acknowledge their ongoing spiritual and cultural connection to Wajak Uja. We acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, where the city of Sydney is now located. We acknowledge and pay our deep respect to elders past and present. We extend that respect to all First Nations people and acknowledge their enduring connection to land, sky, seas and waters. Finally, we pay our deep respect to First Nations people here today and who are following this public hearing online on the mainland and on the islands including in the Torres Strait, especially elders, parents, young people and Kulungas with disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Mason. Uh, Mr Griffin, just before we commence, I understand there's uh, an appearance to be announced for the Northern Territory, so I'll just ask uh, for that appearance to take place. Apparently not. In that case, Mr. Griffin, let's proceed. I think you're on screen. Go on screen, Chair. Sorry, have we got someone on screen? Sorry, Chair, can you hear me now? This is Miss Chalmers. Yes, I can hear you now. Sorry, I couldn't hear I neither hear nor see you. So, Miss Miss Chalmers, you're you're announcing appearance for uh, on behalf of the Northern Territory. Yes, uh, with the Commission's leave, and I'm instructed by the Solicitor for the Northern Territory. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, Mr Griffin. Good morning, Commissioners. The first evidence to be given today will be the witness Jody Ann Barney, and we'll be playing a pre-recorded evidence from her, which I took on the 24th of August, 2022, it runs for approximately 35 minutes. Commissioners, Ms Barney has also made a statement dated the 8th of September 2022, which appears in Tender Bundle B at tab 29 and bears the identification of STAT.0594.0001.0001. In addition, Ms Barney made a previous statement which you heard in Alice Springs in public hearing 25. Now that appears in Tender Bundle B, tab 30, reference STAT.0594.0001.0001. In addition to that, there is a transcript of the pre recorded evidence you'll hear this morning appearing at Tender Bundle. B at tab 38, identification TRA.3000.0015.0001. By way of background for those following this hearing, Ms Barney is a Vera Guba woman with a South Sea Islander background. She is deaf and communicates using Auslan and various forms of First Nations sign languages and written English. She's a founder of the Deaf Indigenous Community Consultancy Proprietary Limited and has been working in this field for a number of years. She is able to understand and communicate in an excess of 20 First Nations sign languages and has previously given evidence that there are in excess of 55 such languages. With the leave of you commissioners, I now 
will play the pre-recorded evidence of Ms. Barney. Mr. Griffin, just a minor point. I think you may have given the same reference for the two separate statements. I think the statement of the 11th of June, 2022 from Ms. Barney is, the reference is 0551 0001. That's correct, Chair. Sometimes I feel like a computer programmer when I read out those references. <laughs> We we'll leave any further comment on that and later. Might I then proceed to the playing of the pre recorded evidence? Yes. You've had considerable experience dealing with people with hearing loss in detention or in prisons. What particular characteristics spring to mind in relation to those people? Hmm. Well, there are huge barriers within the detention system and the justice system. There's no visual information that's provided for inmates. People often don't know what's going on in those settings. There may be a lot of noises coming from random directions, instructions being given, and often deaf or hard of hearing people who are in detention or in prisons are following other people blindly without knowing what's going on. And that can become a little frightening for them. With the community that I work with, who don't have access to information, and certainly not in their first language, they can become quite passive and withdrawn. And they can become very anxious and very aggressive and confused, certainly, because of that. Often people will assume there that their behaviour is dysfunctional, but it's because they don't understand and they're frustrated because there are miscommunications that occur in those settings. You say in your statement that there are at least 55 First Nations sign languages across, across Australia. Mm -hmm. Is it correct that a lot of the people in prison or detention are not familiar with any particular sign language? In my experience, I've had access to five, 55 different sign languages, sign language systems throughout Australia from a very young age. Often in detention settings, there's a lot of hand talk that happens, a lot of gestural communication that happens. And that's based on culture. It's context bound and it's very much related to country, and it can't be transferred to other countries. Often, we learn how to communicate with each other. And in that process, we need to remember that deaf people who are profoundly deaf and use sign language, use a visual means of communicating, and they're much more visually oriented people. They know how to adapt to different contexts in which they find themselves. But what we find is that there's a huge number of people who are hard of hearing, who don't have access to visual language. They can't learn that kind of way. And they're reliant upon other people to speak for them, or they follow, or they can't follow what the rules are and they don't get that information. So there are a lot of barriers for those kinds of people because they don't get the information they need. We have to remember that there's a cultural influence as well. Some communication cannot be spoken about. For example, sorry business. So you'll see completely visual communication being established to have discussions. And often, if I see, or if there are corrections officers that are working in prisons, don't know those cultural protocols and processes, they may think that something is being planned or that they're being deceitful or tricky. There are lots of assumptions that are made by prison staff on those uh, sorts of bases. And it's often where we see a lot of barriers that are created as well, where men and women in youth detention have one way to have their discussions with each other and identify each other and know where they come from, who their family members are and so forth in a visual context. But then corrections officers and corrections staff 
aren't really sure what's going on and they get confused by what they see and that can really make miscommunication happen. And relationships don't work well in that kind of environment for both parties. And you can see there's a lot of suffering that gets created because of that. In your statement, you refer to many First Nations sign language systems form part of a multimodal communication system. For people not familiar with that phrase, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. It's a process whereby you can have your family spoken language existing, but you may also have kinship with another community. And so you learn the sign language of that community and maybe the language of your grandmother or grandparents and so forth. In addition, you may communicate with other people who are friends and you learn from them. So unfortunately, in the work that I've done over the last several decades, I can see that there are many clients out there who use multicultural, multimodal methods of communication, but not fluently. They don't have one language in which they use fluently. In the broader deaf community, there are people who can use Auslan and who can use that language fluently. However, if you're a deaf First Nations person and you just have acquired little bits of a variety of languages, it's very hard to integrate them into a whole and have a communication system that works that you can use to communicate, which can be extremely difficult. And for people who are trying to communicate with that individual, if you don't know those individual sign languages, it can be extremely difficult to communicate with them. Plenty of linguists who approach me and ask me, what on earth is this person saying? And so I have to assist with that. Just going back to the question of assessments, there are certain standard assessments to check someone's hearing level. Yes. Are those standard assessments insofar as you're familiar with them appropriate for First Nations people? No. No. Unfortunately, no, that's not the case. In the Western medical system, audiology and the audiological assessments that are conducted is very disruptive. It's not culturally safe for people who don't know what it means and don't know what's going on. They don't know they have a hearing loss. They may be completely unaware about why the audiological test is being conducted. They've never seen other people in the community who have hearing aids or a cochlear implant or whatever. They've never seen the kind of technological devices that are used. And so the assessment process is foreign to them. If they haven't had any prior experience of that, then it's not culturally safe for them. And often I have clients who fake hearing. They pretend that they can hear. They press the device that they've been given to identify that they can hear a sound. But there's no regular assessments that have been conducted about people. What would a culturally safe assessment process for those people look like? What would be its characteristics? Hmm. I think, as with any communication need that a person has, it needs to be inclusive, it needs to be a visual language, you need to use body language, not only relying upon speech and hearing. Because if you're trying to work out what it is that's going on for a person and you're just relying upon hearing, then there's no context. And a lot of our mob simply don't understand it, they'll ignore it. So if they want to participate fully and entirely, they need to understand the importance of why hearing loss is an important factor. And you can actually fix it if you look after your ears, you look after your physical health and you have regular tests and so on. But access to those kinds of testing regimes is rare. If I'm a 18 year old First Nations boy, stroke young man, with hearing difficulties, 
and I haven't been to court previously, how do you go about describing to me what's involved? Wow, it's extremely difficult. It's a hard concept to unpack for someone. And if the person has never had any exposure previously, no family experience of court or the legal system, it's the first time they've been in trouble, often when I arrive to work with the person, it's important if they're in youth detention to be a bit more therapeutic and uh, to counsel the person when they turn 18 or 19 and go into the adult system then there's no therapy approach there's no counseling approach that's adopted there it's difficult it's hard it's challenging it's a huge change to adjust to and i see in that situation where you're trying to explain what's going to happen you know if you're on remand for example what does that mean and i provide a lot of examples to the person but before that i try to establish communication with the person, what kind of language skills they might have. For example, do they use a cultural sign language system? And if so, what is it? Can they speak or write English, for example? Do they use any technological devices to send SMSs or whatever? That's the first step for me to establish that, communication and language use. But we know culturally, it's not really good to talk about yourself. It's not something people do. And so often, I don't talk about myself. I talk about other people that I support. And that helps the client say, oh, okay, well, it's like telling a story, if you like. It's a narrative approach. And I might say something like, well, I know another young man like yourself. They're not in trouble, but, you know, they've got a friend and they were driving a car and they were skylarking and joyriding and got into an accident and it caused a problem. And so you can see visually that the individual might get it. They're trying to work out what it means for them. And I might say, well, look, you know, this other guy got into trouble and was punished and had to go to court. So it really depends, first of all, on the language level of the person I'm working with. If we have communication established and if we get visual support, like flashcards that we might use or drawing pictures, I'm not really a great artist, I have to say, but I might say, well, you were in that house, you know, where did you stand and what was going on and who were the other people who were there? Was there any food and did you take something out of the fridge or so forth? Things like that. <clears throat> and so I will ask the client to draw a picture. Fortunately, I have some people who are just brilliant artists and can draw really detailed drawings and you can visually see what the circumstance was. And I will often ask them, to maybe talk about time, not in a, a Western way, like Thursday at five o'clock or whatever, but to maybe establish a story in that kind of way through drawing. Culturally, I'm sorry to interrupt. You can't just say, here's the question, give me an answer. Culturally, that's not appropriate. That's why it takes a long time. <laughs> In dealing with your clients in custody, do they always recognise that they have a hearing difficulty? And if they do, will they always come forward for assessment in those custody settings of detention or prison? No, not always. <laughs> Probably around 80% will be completely unaware they have a hearing loss because all of their family has the same kind of hearing loss and so it's normalised within their family group. They just have a loud family, they're always yelling or they use visual means to communicate with each other and they're just simply unaware. And if people come along for a test, they might be reluctant to do that. The other issue is really about safety. If people find out that they can't hear well, they can become bullied, a target of bullying. 
or they might be scapegoated or they might be blamed for other things that happen within the prison system. We see a lot of issues occurring with how people don't want to make it known that they can't hear properly. They're quite secretive about that. Why are they secretive? Risk. They feel vulnerable. If you walk through the prison, you would know that you're constantly being looked at, scrutinised. It's like a fishbowl. You feel kind of stuck in the middle of that fishbowl, people looking at you constantly, other inmates interacting with you. Anything can trigger a person's fear or trigger their outburst. And so you become quite fearful in that circumstance. And there'll be issues that I've encountered with people in detention who have a terrible time at different times of the day in terms of communicating well. In the morning, they'll be alert, they'll be feeling fine, have a good mood, they can see what's going on visually quite easily and quite readily. But by the time the afternoon rolls around, they're getting tired and frustrated and just exhausted from constantly trying to lip read and trying to fit in and they feel very fatigued. And if there's also glare from the afternoon sun or flickering, it can be exhausting for them. It can be a very damaging time for them because that's where they can be attacked, assaulted and so forth. And they miss out on information that's going on within the prison. In your statement, you refer to the fact that conditions like fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, can also mask hearing loss. How does that manifest itself in your experience? Mm, okay. Often with both of those conditions, we see that there are a few factors. Hearing loss can also be a part of those conditions. It can impact on auditory processing skill. A person may be able to hear fairly well, but be unable to make sense of what it means and can't process what the information means for them. And often clients that I work with who have those two conditions, along with a hearing loss, want to have social interaction. They want to participate in the community. And they can participate by observing things visually, but if they can't hear properly and process the information properly, it impacts them in a negative way. And if people find out they can't process auditory information, they label them as stupid or mischievous or cunning and so forth. And they may be a target of, of being attacked or intimidated. And often corrections officers will say, oh, you know, it's just their behaviour. Go here, go there, get out, you know. And often these staff are not aware of why there's an issue. So young people and adults and women in particular, a growing number of deaf and hard of hearing women who are in detention now are more reactive in their interactions. They're visually reactive. They will have uh, strong verbal outbursts and often people will find that aggressive. They interpret it as aggressive or not respectful and not complying, which therefore means that there'll be a punishment or they'll have a black mark against their name for that non-compliant behaviour, or they might then be denied something, they might miss out on something. I've worked with deaf women who can't get a job in the prison, if you like, they can't find some kind of work in the prison because the officers will say, you're argumentative, you don't listen to me, you don't comply. And so the female inmate misses out on 
being able to have those opportunities, they'll become quite silent and, and may look as though they're quite argumentative and aggressive. Can I move on now to the issue raised in your statement about the use of informal spokespeople in detention centres instead of formally trained interpreters? What can you tell the Commission about that phenomenon? Mm. Okay. Unfortunately, I have had a great number of experiences where I have arrived in the prison where there might be staff who will say to me, no, look, it's okay, we've talked to the inmate already, and I'll say, hang on, this person's profoundly deaf. How did you communicate? Can you use sign language? And the response is, oh, no, there's another person here, another man or another woman here who can come to interpret for maybe medical issues for video interpreting into a courtroom. And I will say, just a moment, is this person qualified as an interpreter? And the response is, oh, well, they know each other really well. They think, oh, we think they're culturally appropriate, they're good friends and so forth. But really, the deaf person is too terrified to say no and to decline the assistance and that they don't want it. But at the same time, there are other inmates who will say, oh, I'll know about his information. I know his case. I know what's going on. <coughs> and so that information can be shared and then used against the deaf or hard of hearing inmate. It's terrifying and it should not happen, but I've seen it happen so many times and it's dreadful. So are there two types of people in that situation? One who purports to be the spokesperson for the deaf person and the other who is characterised as their buddy, their friend who can speak for them. Mm. Yes, there are often uh, two people involved. The person who is kind of the representative, the spokesperson, if you like, Decisions might be made by the family of the inmate. We see this happens a lot where we have family, kinship relationships and so forth. People who provide support in the process around cultural knowledge and can support the language and communication and interaction. And often that person then doesn't have a choice. They just have to comply. They just accept the person who's placed into that role. But at the same time, they have no really comprehensive skill. They've been located there by the family or because of kinship connection in order to be the spokesperson for the inmate. And they don't have skill to do that. Is one possible consequence of what you've just said that other inmates in a prison, <coughs> other inmates in a prison could become aware of the details of a person's NDIS plan and its funding. Oh yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's a huge issue. When I visit clients, I can have a private conversation with them in sign language. And if we're fast enough, people who might be watching don't have a clue what we're talking about. However, if I'm there with another client who has very minimal language skill and understanding and talking with their NDIS planner or their advocate, there might be other clients located in the same area who can hear well enough to be able to overhear those conversations and they will grab snippets of those conversations and discussions. It's not confidential at all. It's not a confidential process and it's quite dangerous in my view. Can that information become currency within the prison which can then be used against the inmate? Yes, indeed. For example, Most mob, yeah. my mob, other mobs, don't really understand the NDIS and its processes. 
they believe that the funding will make them rich, that they'll have a lot of money that's available to them. And they'll say, oh, you've got money, well, just give it to me. You've got a, a card that you use to go to the commissary in the prison. Come on, put some money on that card so you can then go and use it. And they'll say, look, I don't know, I don't understand about that. If they disregard those approaches, And clients can feel isolated, more alone, more alienated, ignored, fearful, and a whole range of other emotions. So if I'm going to talk about the NDIS with inmates or what's going to happen for them on parole and after release and so forth, I need to make sure that it's as private as it can be for us to have those discussions. And often, the client, whether it's a man or a woman, will say, just be careful, quiet, there are people watching us, don't talk about that now. Moving on to a, another topic, you mentioned in your statement the desirability of training of detention and correctional staff to be able to assist and understand detainees mm. with hearing difficulties. You then go on to say that in your experience, staff generally do not have the time to receive the training or there's no funding available for it. Can you tell you the Royal Commission your experience of trying to initiate some form of training in relation to issues you've been raising? What would it look like? Okay. A few years ago, <clears throat> I was working in Alice Springs in a detention centre, in the prison there, in fact. And after visiting a client who was in that facility, I asked if I could have a chat with the, the superintendent of the prison. I asked if I could have a quick chat and talk about how to support the staff and their interactions with the client. Because that person had some serious issues and, and had committed a serious crime. So we needed to know how to communicate with this person. Fortunately, the superintendent was quite willing to organise for me to go along and have a chat during lockdown periods. And that was brilliant because I could then ask all of the staff, what is it that you see what are the things that are happening? And you think, hmm, I don't know what they're talking about. Or I need them to know this, that or the other thing. I just asked that question of staff and got their feedback and their responses. And I gave them a lot of examples to say, well, look, if you see this kind of sign or this kind of behaviour, here's what it might mean. And they kind of connected the dots and it really was very helpful. Then I came back again. I think a month later I flew back into Alice Springs and the client said, wow, this is great. They're trying to gesture and sign to me and point to things I need to know and I can understand things now. And they got a job in the prison. They gave me a job. So I think that that was fantastic. That was a really good example. And I know from other prisons that I visited that They're very overcrowded. There are too many inmates. There aren't uh, sufficient staff numbers. There's a high level of turnover of staff and a lot of other training that's compulsory for them to undertake for compliance purposes. So working with deaf or hard of hearing clients is a very low priority and learning how to do that better. You know, there are other issues of managing diabetes and so forth other critical health needs that just aren't being addressed because there are other priorities that take precedence over that. Can I raise with you one of the recommendations you make at the end of your statement, which strikes me as being very practical and could be implemented very quickly? And that's the use of television screens 
to explain prisoner protocols, public health information, and such information which will assist prisoners with hearing difficulties. Can you elaborate a little bit upon how you would see that working? Yeah, certainly. I believe that when men, women and youth are locked down overnight or, you know, from whatever time they're, they're locked in, I think to myself, what do they do? They watch a lot of TV. So the prison channel would be able to have information that they could broadcast in a visual way. They could use cartoon formats, they could use role plays and have the message then conveyed clearly. The same as they did with COVID information. That had a huge impact. It was great. And so that's where you'd be able to disseminate information. The hospitals have a similar kind of system, I think, where they inform people who might be bedridden, they can watch their television and get information and understand what's going on for them. That's where you could have the same kind of system for deaf or hard of hearing people at prison. The same for people who have uh, the double disadvantage of not being able to hear well and not being able to see well. People who have critical health needs, really, really critical illnesses, are not getting the information appropriately. For example, a deaf man who has diabetes, who might be in a cell with a hearing man, the man who can hear doesn't know how to communicate with the deaf cellmate, doesn't understand diabetes at all, and if the deaf or hard of hearing man has a hypoglycemic episode, what do they do? What does their cellmate do? If the person who can hear is able to watch information on a screen and understand what to do, they know how to manage the situation and how to assist. Not become a doctor, of course, I don't mean that, but to provide critical assistance, they get enough information to make sure that the, the cellmate who can hear won't panic in that situation. You also make two deceptively simple suggestions. Visual, visual alarms as well as sirens and good lighting. Why are they so important? Well, <laughs> there are many reasons I could list. In, the la in relation to visual alarms, it would help everyone in the prison to be able to know what's going on, to know what the emergency is. Having lighting that's adequate improves visual access. You're able to see over long distances rather than trying to struggle in the darkness. It helps people who have dark coloured skin to be able to see other people's facial expressions. That helps a lot. It's very subtle, but it's extremely important to have good lighting for visual communication. I'm not talking about spotlights. <laughs> I'm just talking about adequate lighting that's bright enough to be able to see well. Jodie, what's your principal takeaway message you would like to give to the Royal Commissioners sitting on this hearing? People like me who work at the grassroots level, who work with organisations, peak organisations and so forth, who work with everyday legal people, practitioners, correctional officers, prison staff, we need to have a conversation. We have the frontline conversations, people like me. But I have an issue with uh, when the system itself won't comply with what's required, won't provide access and training as a mandatory condition 
as a mandatory protocol. Where court services and court organisations must provide access to interpreters. Principal judges, magistrates, and chief justices also have to learn about the importance of communication and access to language because they're putting our mob into prison. And if they can't communicate and they can't understand and they don't know how it works, then we're going to have a failure. It'll fail our mob. And it can be prevented. Yes, Mr Griffin. Commissioners, can I indicate to you that one week ago on the 14th of September, Ms Barney was awarded a Churchill Fellowship. And the citation indicates that she's to engage with professionals and leaders who are working with First Nations deaf people in justice systems. By visiting other leaders, maintaining legal access, using cultural sign languages, to share experiences of working within the Western justice system and create opportunities to design and implement First Nations deaf principles relating to cultural access within the legal systems. To look at early intervention programs, advocacy and successful service delivery and create opportunities within the legal system across Australia. Global partnerships development and cultural professional exchange of research to eliminate racism and oppression amongst those people in custody. Thank you for that uh, information, Mr. Griffin. And uh, I would like on behalf of the commissioners to thank Ms. Barney for the assistance she's provided to the Royal Commission, not only at this hearing, but uh, at another hearing as well. And uh, to wish her every success with uh, the uh, Churchill Fellowship, which is a wonderful opportunity for her and also for the people about whom she's been speaking today. Chair, might we have a short adjournment whilst we prepare the next witness? Yes, uh, it's now uh, quarter to, nearly quarter to 10 uh, Perth time. Shall we resume at uh, 9.50? Thank you, Commissioner. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Mr. Griffin. Chair, the next witness is Terry. He will take an oath. Can I indicate before he does that, that the joint statement of Terry and Cara dated the 14th of September, 2022, is in tender bundle A at tab one, and bears the identification number of stat.0624.0001. Yes, thank you. Um, Terry, thank you very much for the statement that you have uh, prepared together with Cara. Uh, we have that statement and uh, of course we have read it and thank you too for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. We very much appreciate the assistance you are providing. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of Commissioner Mason's associate, she will administer the oath to you. Thank you very much. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Terry, um, you will see that uh, Commissioner Mason and Commissioner McEwen are in the Perth hearing room, as is uh, Mr Griffin, who is about to ask you some questions. I am located during this hearing in the 
Sydney hearing room, but we're all connected by virtue of the wonders of uh, technology. So I'll now ask uh, Mr. Griffin to ask you some questions. Terry, you have a son who's known in these proceedings as Aaron. That's correct. Aaron was diagnosed with ADHD as a child. That is also correct. He started having contact with police at about the age of 12. Yes. As a result of the behaviour related to his ADHD in your view. That is correct. Can you describe to the commissioners what Aaron was like at that age? He was uh, very active. Um, he took a lot of both uh, my time and Cara's time um, to uh, watch over him and make sure that obviously he wasn't um, getting into situations that were obviously would lead to him injuring himself or, you know, in, in trouble. Um, yeah. He'd been diagnosed when he was very young, hadn't he? That, that is correct. And you and Cara had immigrated from New Zealand about 25 years ago? That is right, yes. And you have three children? That is correct. How did his condition manifest during his schooling? Um, there were many incidences during his schooling where his behaviour was such that um, the school would call us to come and get him because they couldn't manage his behaviour. Uh, he would also run around the school grounds um, and not do what was required of him and also leave the school grounds um, and go to shopping centres and get onto public transport and various things like that. Very early on, Aaron had been prescribed Ritalin. Yes. What did you understand the purpose of that medication was? That purpose of that medication, in my understanding, was to enable him to focus on the task. Um, it was sort of described to me that it was like, prior to having it, having three or four radio stations on at the same time, and it would then enable it to be just the one station that he could hear and understand and focus on. So, yeah, he, he enabled that clarity and function um, and focus that he needed to have. And was Aaron much calmer when he was on Ritalin? Yes, he was. Um, he was a lot easier to deal with. Um, he was more aware of what was going on in the world around him. Um, and more compliant. And as a young child, he still was fairly spontaneous, wasn't he? You had to use one of the old style children's harnesses to make sure he didn't run off all the time? Yes, that is correct, especially when going to shopping centres. Um, even if he was in a stroller with the straps of the stroller done up, we also had to have a harness as well, and one of us had to watch him while the other did the shopping and, and was looking for what was needed. And when you immigrated to Australia, Aaron was about three years of age? That's correct. And did you go and see a paediatrician when you arrived in Australia in relation to his health? Yes, that's correct. And what happened during that consultation? Um, we were informed that obviously in Australia, the medication um, that he was prescribed previously in New Zealand wouldn't be able to be prescribed here um, and that he would have to go through different medications um, and yeah, try them to see if they would do the same job. Now, you're not medically um, trained, Terry, but you had a general understanding, I take it, that Ritalin had some controversy surrounding it. Yes. Yeah. So did the Australian paediatrician um, prescribe some other medication? Yes. Um, the, the other medications that weren't obviously amphetamine-based mm. medications. And were they as effective as Ritalin had been? No, not at all. 
And how did that manifest itself? Um, an escalation in his behaviour of, yeah, just, I guess, to sum it up, sort of being almost out of control, um, constantly moving from one thing to the next. Um, and, yeah, we would have to focus a lot on what he was doing to make sure he didn't injure himself or similar. And that eventually led to Ritalin being prescribed again, didn't it? That is correct, yes. Was it also the case that when he was about 12 years of age, Aaron was diagnosed with autism? That is correct. Tell the commissioners, what were the circumstances of that diagnosis? Um, that was uh, done through uh, what was uh, Disability Commission, I think it was. It was prior to the uh, NDIS. Um, he was referred on to them and a specialist there who diagnosed that he had autism also. When you received that diagnosis, did you reflect upon whether or not it could or should have been made much earlier than 12 years of age? Yes. Um, because of experiences with another child um, and with his uh, diagnosis earlier, um, we became aware that some of the behaviours that he was exhibiting were um, autistic behaviours, uh, was part from his ADHD behaviour. And during his early schooling, Aaron had a habit of disappearing and getting on trains and travelling all over the place. Is that right? Yes, that is very much the case. I think you observed that he became very well known to security guards on the rail network. Yes. Um, they would know both myself and Cara by sight, and um, they would know that we would be there looking for Aaron and they had a good communication between guards and, and very quickly we were able to locate where he possibly was um, because they seemed to all know him very well. And they have great assistance to you and Cara, weren't they? Yes, they were. You know, there were many times that um, they provided great assistance and help. When Aaron commenced high school, he was prescribed Exa-amphetamine. That's correct. What was the reason for that? Um, that was to, for his um, ADHD behaviour mm -hmm. um, and, and that was also to help with his focus for schoolwork. And was he also prescribed clonidine? Yes, uh, that medication was to be given at night so that it would um, calm him and allow him to sleep at night. And both of those medications were of general assistance? Yes, both were very good. And also in high school, he was in the education support unit? That's correct. What does that mean? Uh, it's a special um, class where the teachers are trained more to deal with children with disabilities and there are also assistants that help the teachers. So there's a greater number of staff ratio to the children uh, so that they have a greater chance of learning. Now, initially that was of benefit to Aaron as far as you could see? Yes, definitely. Did it continue throughout his high school? No, um, it seemed in the latter part of high school that the program was very much a repeat year to year and he very quickly lost interest um, and started to um, disappear from school, not go. And then, yeah, obviously I so he was out with people that weren't so desirable. And this disappearing and not attending school occurred in what would have been the last few years of his schooling? That's correct. So when Aaron ceased going to school, what was his level of reading and writing ability? Um, I would say very basic. Um, he would write a, 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 yeah, a fairly simple sentence. Um, 
and yeah, uh, is I can't remember the word I'm looking for. The the ability for one to read his writing was very difficult. Um, yeah, it wasn't very clear at all. Did he have a wide circle of friends whilst at school? No, he only had a few friends while he was at school. And yeah. Did his behaviour have an effect on you and Kara and your relationship with other parents at the school? Yes, very much so. We were um, mainly associating with other parents that had children with uh, disabilities and yeah, uh, certainly not with the mainstream of the school. You mentioned in the statement at paragraph 21 that Aaron is easily influenced by people uh, because of his autism and because of his very limited ability to read yes. people well. When you use the expression read people well, what do you mean by that? Um, understanding that uh, people's intentions, though they may appear friendly, were to benefit themselves and take advantage of Aaron um, in whatever way that they felt they could. Um, yeah. Was Aaron one of those boys that when something happened, he was the one that got caught? It seemed to be very much the case. Um, yes, he was at high school by various staff, um, pulled up for being the one that was responsible for something happening. Um, and it seemed very much so that it was very regular that he was the one accused of what had happened. I want to now ask you some questions about his contact with the criminal justice system. Around 12, he started getting picked up by the police when he was across the other side of town. Yes, that's correct. And when he was about 14, he was caught throwing things off a freeway bridge onto into oncoming traffic. That's correct. What happened as a result of that? Uh, he uh, had to appear in court and um, obviously he had a sentence where he'd had a curfew. Um, also, he had, I think, some other punishments. I can't quite recall what they were at this time. Um, and when you say he had a curfew, was that a court-imposed order or was that sort of an unofficial agreement between you and the police? Uh, that was more unofficial um, initially. And, yeah, obviously, um, yeah, he, his understanding was that it was official. And you didn't disabuse him of that notion? No, 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 definitely not. Uh, it was very effective at that time. Point. Does it flow from that that at that stage um, you and Cara had a relatively good relationship with the police that were dealing with Aaron? Yes. Yeah. Um, it seems, correct me if I'm wrong, that they were attempting to work with you to work out a practical response to his behaviour. Yes, very much so. And you appreciated that? Oh, greatly, yes. But then subsequently he was arrested in relation to a property offence. Yes. And he was remanded in a juvenile detention centre. Yes. What do you recollect about his admission to the juvenile detention centre? <laughs> it was a very difficult time for both him and ourselves. Um, there were um, very, well, we tried to provide the prison with all information regarding his diagnosis of um, of ADHD and autism and the medications that he was on um, and also supply what medication we had um, to the prison so that he could start and continue obviously with the medication regime that he was on. Um, we were informed obviously that the medication um, would not be given in prison um, because of that type of medication. Um, and that he would only have his medication that he would be given at night, which was the clonidine. Harry, um, can we just go back uh, a step? Sure. Um, 
in order for Aaron to go to the juvenile detention centre, he presumably had to go to the children's court and the children's court imposed a sentence. That's correct. And were you or Cara with him in the court when that happened? Yes, we were. Was he represented by a lawyer at that time? I think so, yes. It would have probably been um, legal aid. Right. And do you remember whether the court was advised about Aaron's background and the uh, diagnoses that he had received? I can't recall whether that came up at the time. So as far as you remember, there was no particular provision made for him in any sentence or order of the court that took account of those uh, conditions for which he'd been diagnosed? No, no. As far as I was aware, he was treated as any other child would have been, um, yeah, without a, a difference. Disability. I see. Thank you. Yeah, yes, Mr. Griffin, sorry to interrupt. Just picking up from the questions of the chair, was it the case that he was initially remanded to the detention centre? Big punk. Was he remanded to the detention centre before he was convicted and sentenced? Yes. And so your first experience with the detention centre was when he was on remand? That would be correct, yes. And just picking up on your answers a moment ago, did you also provide to the centre letters from the paediatrician? That is correct. And did you understand that the centre couldn't continue with the medications because they were amphetamine based? That is correct. What did the staff of the centre tell you about getting Aaron back on medication? What was the process, if any, they described? Um, that virtually he would not be given the amphetamine-based medication and that th there would be only the clonidine that would be given at night and no other medication and, and no uh, program or um, consultation with anybody as to an alternative medication that he could have. Terry, are you familiar with the medical term tapering of medication? Yes, I am. What do you understand that to mean? Uh, that's where one is gradually reduced or increased. Tapering obviously is reducing um, mm -hmm. medication um, until it gives time for the body to adjust uh, to the different levels of medication. And is your understanding that that process is usually carried out under medical supervision? Definitely, yes. Am I correct? in assuming from your previous answers that he went from taking the medication to nothing. That's absolutely correct. With the exception of the clonidine, which was to help him sleep. Yes. Did you observe any reaction by Aaron to the removal of the medication? Yes, he became very uh, withdrawn um, and I'm pretty sure we were told that it also some of his behaviours had escalated um, when he was in custody. He, he would have been very difficult to uh, reason with and, and know what was expected of him uh, without the medication. In addition to his conditions, Aaron was physically quite small? Yes, very much so. And did that to your observation, make him behave in a way which was concerned about his physical situation in the, in the detention centre? Um, obviously, we were concerned that he would be um, obviously maybe picked upon um, and you know, his small nature, he would not be able to really look after himself. Um, I want, to now, vulnerable. Yes. I want to now move to events which occurred in the detention centre, yep. which you deal with from paragraph 30 onwards in your statement. Sure. Aaron told you and Cara that he had been raped by his cellmate, is that correct? That is correct. When did you find out about this? 
either from Aaron or from the detention centre? I had a phone call from the detention centre and was advised that Aaron wanted to speak with me and he, when I spoke with him, advised me that he had been raped and um, that, yes, um, he had told, obviously, the medical staff um, that this had happened and then, obviously, the process started where he was able to contact me. Did Aaron tell you when the incident occurred? He informed me it had happened during the night, early hours of the morning, um, and yeah. And did he tell you whether he immediately reported it to the authorities? Not at that time, no. It wasn't until the next morning when he went uh, for um, to medical, I think it may have been for medication or something like that, um, that he informed them or when he saw a medical person. Was it the case that you heard about the incident from Aaron before you heard anything from the detention centre? Yes, I only heard from him. How long after he told you this did you hear from anyone from the detention centre? Uh, only at the end of the call did someone speak to me to inform me that I could come to the prison and be with them at that time. Sorry. Did you... Gary, just to get the chronology straight, I just want to make sure I understand that the rape occurred in the early morning that is after midnight. That's correct. You had the telephone call with um, Aaron at about midday that day. That is some presumably nine, 10, 11 hours later. That's correct. And then during that conversation, you were told, as I understand it, that you could come the next day to the centre to see Aaron in person. Yes. And that's what you did. That is correct. So on the next day, you saw Aaron at the centre outside of visiting hours. That's correct. And, and Mr Griffin may want to ask you, of course, some more questions about that, but I just wanted to be clear as to which days we were talking about. Thank you. Yes, sure. When you went to see Aaron, were you able to see him immediately? No, when I got to the detention centre, I was made to wait a number of hours uh, before I was able to see Aaron. When you saw him, did he tell you about what had happened after he made the complaint? Yes. He informed me that he'd been instructed uh, by staff um, for him and the cellmate, um, the person that raped him, to strip the cell of all bedding and for them to uh, change their clothing and to take everything to laundry and see that it was washed. And yeah, that was... was did Aaron tell you he was told to... Shower and change yes, clothes. that also was the case. He was mm -hmm. told to shower and change clothes. And that direction also came from the staff of the centre? Yes, definitely from the staff of the centre. Is it your understanding that the centre then notified the police? Uh, that happened, yes, probably when I was at the uh, detention centre. And also what's known as the Sexual Assault Resource Centre. Yes. Otherwise called SARC. Yes. Do you have any knowledge based upon any conversation you had about what the police and SARC team did when they arrived at the centre? Yes, I was present when SARC um, did their 
various examinations and testing um, and time reflections. Um, and yep, yeah, I was present while that was done. Did Sark give Aaron some medication? Yes, he was given uh, medication that would prevent sexually transmitted diseases. And was he transferred to the Royal Perth Hospital Sexual Health Clinic? Yes, he was um, given appointments to visit them on a regular basis um, for testing uh, for the next 12 months, to make what, sure that he didn't have any sexually transmitted diseases. And there was also, I understand, a concern about HIV. That is also correct, yes. Just moving forward for a moment, the result of those regular visits to the Royal Perth Hospital resulted in what finding? Uh, finding that he didn't have um, any sexually transmitted diseases or AIDS or HIV. If I move beyond this part, did you at the um, time... Sorry, Mr Griffin, before you go on, could I ask when Sark first met with Aaron and you were there, yes. and then ongoing interaction. Yeah. What was your perception of how the staff from Sark um, interacted with Aaron? Were they aware of his disability? Did they provide appropriate support? Do you have any observations? Yes. In my observations are that Sark themselves were very professional um, and that they were very sensitive to the process and to Aaron's needs. Um, yeah, I would say I couldn't ask for more um, from them. And yes, the service they gave. And so it's uh, fair to say that you felt that they were disability aware or that they could provide sort of a tailored approach. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, definitely. They, they seem to be able to um, relate to him and, and provide him um, with what I would call appropriate care for someone that had difficulties and disabilities. Thank you. Terry, uh, as I understand it, the police and the SART team arrived in the early evening of the day when you had spoken to Eric. Yes, that's right. That and uh, Commissioner McEwen has asked you about the Sark team. Yes. What, uh, what, if anything, did the police say to you that day when they arrived and during the course of their stay at uh, the centre? Uh, very little from the police at that point. Just virtually that, obviously, they would be investigating. Um, and that it would, you know, they would have to wait for results from Sark and things like that. And also, um, there would be an interview of Aaron um, to obviously get his statement um, as to what had occurred. Did any did any uh, representative of the representative of the police say anything about? Aaron and his cellmate having showered before they were called? Um, not at that point on that day when that happened, no. Um, at a later stage, they did comment on it. The police did? Yes. To you directly? Um, it would have been yes to myself and to uh, Cara. Um, and what we, did they? And what did they communicate to you about that matter? Um, I'm sorry. Can we repeat just that question? The point that you were asking specifically. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm asking you about what the police told you, and I first asked you what they told you on the day they arrived, which is the first day that you saw Aaron. And you've indicated that on that day, they did not say anything about Aaron and his cellmate having showered before they were asked to come to the centre. And then I think you said that although nothing was said by the police at that time, something was said later. 
yeah, it, it, later on they said that due to the results from SARC, that obviously there wasn't enough uh, physical evidence present to proceed with a charge. Um, in their opinion, it would be Aaron's word against the accused, um, and that, yeah. I understand that. Uh, my, my, my question, and I, if you can't remember, then please yep. say so, but my question was whether the police said that uh, the fact that Aaron and his cellmate had showered before the police were involved had made some difference to the investigation. No, not specifically on that, and as far as I recall. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Griffin. And Terry, sorry, I have a follow-up question sure. from the chair. What was your observation, if you can remember, yeah. of how the police were interacting with Aaron? And again, it relates to my question about Sark. Were they disability aware? Did they tailor their approach? Do you have any observation? At the time uh, when Sark was there and the police made first contact, um, there was very little um, communication from the police as to what their involvement would be, apart from the fact that they would be speaking with Aaron and, and awaiting the tests. Um, there was no comment on, on the fact, or, as I understand, of anything else apart from that. Thank you. Were you present when they spoke to Aaron? Uh, oh, no, that was done. Um, we were um, at the uh, police, um, the sexual assault squad headquarters, um, and he was interviewed separately from us with um, a trained person. I'm not sure what they were special qualifications were, but they were trained to uh, speak with children that had obviously experienced sexual assault. Do you know whether or not the police or that trained person were aware of Aaron's disabilities when they conducted that interview? I can't exactly recall, no, whether they were or not. Had you told the police of his particular disabilities? Yes. And when did you do that? Uh, that would have been at the time when they were at the prison. Aaron was subsequently released from the detention centre. Sure. And my understanding was prior to his release, he'd been kept in the medical unit at the centre for four or five days. That is correct. That was until his case was heard at the Children's Court. That is right. During that period of time, were you allowed to spend any time with him? No. Um, the only times that we were allowed to spend with him would have been normal visiting days and times. Terry, to an outsider, assuming what Aaron described to you was what happened, yes. one would imagine that parents would want to spend as much time with their child as possible. Yes, very much so. Did you raise with the authorities within the detention centre a request along those lines? I'm sure I would have said to them that I would have appreciated to being able to see him and speak with him regularly, yes. Do you remember if you received any response? Just virtually that the only times that would be available would be the normal days that one would visit and that there was no consideration of special arrangement. How did this make you and Cara feel? Very um, sort of isolated and almost dismissed, like it was not a, a concern, um, and that 
Aaron would be quite fine. Um, and yeah, it left us very disappointed that there didn't seem to be a lot of care taken for him or what had happened at that point. When he was released from the centre, yep. did you make any observations about how he was coping with the time you'd spent in the centre? Yes, he was very withdrawn and uh, really uh, not himself at all. He really withdrew into himself. Um, yeah. Can you Just, give us some examples of that behaviour, how it was different from when he went into the centre? Um, there were different things that um, obviously would happen. He, he would um, obviously during the day when his weight be withdrawn and, and not very communicative with us. Um, but then at night, he would have night terrors. And um, there are times when I'd be awoken uh, by him and would go into his room and that he would be attempting to climb out of the bedroom window or virtually climb the walls of the bedroom, um, trying to escape from something. Um, he seemed extremely distressed and yeah, um, it took a lot of effort to calm him and get him back to a place where he would be able to get more sleep. After his release, Sark offered him some sexual assault counselling? Yes, they did. Did he take that up? He did take it up, um, but it was very much um, not successful uh, during some of the uh, uh, counselling sessions, I was informed afterwards that he had said maybe a few words, if anything at all. Did that prompt you then to offer to attend any counselling session? Yes, I suggested that maybe if I was present that I could prompt him into opening up a little bit more and, and to start sharing, you know, a little of what he was feeling and thinking. Did that lead to any change in his response to the counselling? No, very little. Um, and he, he just he completely shut down and, and wasn't seemed incapable incapable of um, sharing what he was feeling and thinking. You mentioned in paragraph forty six of your statement that when Aaron's case was heard at the children's court, the lawyer appearing for him requested a closed session. That's correct so she could explain to the magistrate what had happened to Aaron in the detention centre. Yes. And he was granted immediate release. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. He returned to your home? Yes. How would you describe his demeanour, his conduct upon his return to the home? Um, he was yeah obviously it is difficult for us um in, in knowing how to um relate with him um because he was so withdrawn um and that obviously um the times when he'd wait with night terrors um that you know we were obviously having to take turns to Calm him, so it was very disruptive for the family life at that time. Can I take the opportunity to read paragraph 48 of your statement? Yeah. And then I'll ask for your response. Aaron has never received an apology or any other communication from any staff at the detention centre about how the assault was handled. Yes, that's correct. How do you feel about that? Extremely disappointed. Um, I feel that the whole thing from start to finish was mishandled, covered up. Um, and that impression formed very quickly from 
the time when I arrived at the detention centre and it was made to wait an additional couple of hours when I would have assumed that I should have been able to go very much fairly soon through and be with them. But no, to wait another couple of hours, it just left me totally dismayed and alarmed at what was happening. I take this opportunity to ask you to communicate to the commissioners whether, based on your experience of what happened to Aaron, what you would recommend should have happened? Well, I feel that someone should have been there to explain what the process would be um, and that obviously um, for a start, that the instructions to obviously change clothing and, and a shower and all those things that happen would not be the case. It, it should have been that the police, in my opinion, were the first ones to be called. And um, from their direction, obviously, and, that, and also Sark's uh, input as to what should happen from there on. Uh, it seemed very much yeah, that there was no procedures or policies in place and they were making it up on the fly. Can I invite you to read out loud yep. to those observing this hearing, paragraph 55. His experience in the detention centre is something that has traumatised us as parents. We were not able to protect him, and that is something that we have great difficulty coming to accept. Do you recognise there was objectively nothing more you could have done? Yes. Um, in time, I've come to realise that, obviously, as a parent, um, he was in detention. There was nothing at all that I could have done to prevent what had happened or to change it. But despite that, you still had the reaction you just read out? Yes, definitely. Um, but to me, that is one of the greatest instincts of a parent is to be there to protect your child from whatever it may be. And when you're unable to do so, it, it has an effect on you that lasts for a very long time. How old is Aaron now? Aaron's in his late 20s. In brief, what are his current circumstances? His current circumstances are that um, he at times is homeless. Um, and living on the streets. Um, he does, supposed to have uh, carers and NDIS funding um, to provide them with a place to stay and those carers. Um, but it seems to be a great um, difficulty for that to be organized to be something that is consistently in place and that he has a, a place that he could call home and um, live in for a length of time. It seems very much a, a situation where it changes that he's shifting from one place to the next and, and in, um, uh, what's the, it's like hostile short-term accommodation. Um, which is not suitable at all. Can I move now to some recommendations which you want to suggest yes. to the commissioners? And the first is that children and young people with disabilities should have an advocate appointed as soon as they enter a detention centre. That is correct. What's your thinking behind that? Um, 
I feel that a lot of children with disabilities uh, struggle to understand what is expected of them in the prison system, um, where they should go, what they should do. Um, and um, it becomes, I would say, very overwhelming very quickly. And if they had somebody there that they understood was there for them to answer any questions they might have and help them adjust to um, being in custody, uh, it, it would be a great help to them. Um, I think it would be you know, very overwhelming without something like that. It appears from your evidence, Terry, that there was a disjunction between the care Aaron was receiving prior to detention and what happened during detention. Yes. How could we overcome that? I think with having better trained staff and those that are specialised in dealing with children with disabilities and mental health, um, so that their needs can be great understood and met um, their needs. Um, so that, yeah, they, they get the care and support they require. You also point out that either some communication or better communication with a detainee's treating GP or specialist or any other health or disability professionals would greatly assist. Yes, definitely. Um, to have that knowledge as to what their current treatment is in their past history, um, I think would benefit all involved in um, custody and in caring for them while they're in custody to understand what their needs specifically are. There's also the issue of making an assessment about whether the detainee requires some protection because of their disabilities. Yes. What are your views about that? Oh, definitely I feel that um, those that have, from my experience, autism are uh, very um, easily groomed or led um, and influenced. Um, so they are very vulnerable to those that may seek to do harm to them. And yeah, if they were able to be in a single cell, um, then I think it would offer the protection that those that are very vulnerable need. Terry, is there anything you want to tell the commissioners that is either not in your statement or I haven't covered this morning? The only thing I think would be that um, at the conclusion of this, I would like to see it not only be the words and recommendations, but the actions, imp the implementation of the change. That to me is the most significant thing I'd like to see out of this, is that there is some policing or, or enforcement of those changes that are recommended. It's great to have all the ideas of, and knowledge of what we need to do, but without the implementation, it, to me, doesn't mean a great deal. And that's something I really look forward to seeing is that change. And if the Western Australian government were to seek to transform the way detention, juvenile detention centres are managed would you and Cara be open to being involved in that process? Yes, I definitely would be. Um, I feel we all have a duty, um, even as parents of people with disabilities, um, to share what we know and feel that would benefit all those that have difficulties and disabilities and to work together to improve the system for all so that these things don't reoccur. Chair, there are the questions I have for Terry. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Uh, Terry, if it's okay with you, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions for you. Sure. And I'll start with uh, Commissioner Mason. Yep. 
Um, thank you, Chair. I've just got a couple of questions, sure. uh, Terry. <clears throat> when um, when your son, um, Aaron, <clears throat> excuse yes. me, um, a child in uh, detention was raped, um, after that he was taken to the hospital ward or a medical unit, which looked like a hospital ward, it's in your statement at 42. Yes. He, uh, it also says that um, he wasn't receiving any medication while he was in the medical unit. That's at um, 44. He was without his medication. Yes. Um, his amphetamine-based medication wasn't given to him the whole time that he was in custody. And, yeah, um, that really had an impact on him as far as his behaviours and um, just the way... I guess he was. He just struggled to cope uh, without it. Um, I could see him, yeah, obviously withdrawing very much every day um, that I had contact, um, whether it be by phone or when we visited him. Uh, I think there were two days a week that we visited him. Each time we could see that there was more withdrawing and less verbal communication from him. Thank you. Um, the second question I have is about this uh, word that we've heard <clears throat> in the Royal Commission called intersectionality. Have you heard that word before and do you know what it means? No, I haven't. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Commissioner McEwen. Uh, thank you. Terry, uh, thank you for your evidence. I have one topical question. Can I take you to paragraph 47 of your statement? And that relates to the post-detention circumstances. Yeah. It says that Aaron had to comply with strict conditions. So putting that aside, what if any kind of support or post-detention support with Aaron offered or with the family offers where you referred to organisation, what can you recall from that time? And I want to understand then the link to the NDIS, if you can then um, explain that. Um, the only support that was given was follow-up at um, SARC for counselling. And from that, um, also at uh, a hospital appointment, with the uh, clinic where they obviously gave him medication for sexually transmitted diseases and did the various testing for that. Um, your further question was about NDIS, exactly what, how he became connected with them. Is that what you're looking to know? Well, yes. So uh, you've just described that he had uh, appointments in relation to SARC and yeah. then medication. What about more broad support, such as looking for employment, um, transitioning back into the community? Um, so you can see you're shaking your head, so it sounds like none of, none Not of a, that. Nothing that I'm aware of really further from those um, mm -hmm. two things, the, the hospital and SARC for counselling at that time. Uh, very much, yeah, only those two. Mm. So it's fair to say, really, he should. It would have been helpful, do you think, in your opinion, if he'd had support around, you know, um, integration back into the community, housing, uh, employment, yes. uh, general. Okay, and then the NDIS. At what point did he get onto the NDIS? Um, he initially was with the system before NDIS. So uh, once. Mm -hmm. um, the new NDI system came into place, it was a matter of a transitional through to that. Um, and yeah, obviously it's been ongoing and yeah, with regular reviews. 
Okay, um, thank you, and thank you again for your evidence. Thank you. The opportunity. Harry, uh, just, just a couple of things, again, to clarify in my <coughs> own mind. <clears throat> when uh, the events we've been talking about occurred, um, was this the first time that Aaron had been in custody? Yes. And at the time these events occurred, he was actually on remand arising out of charges that he had uh, presumably stolen property or committed a property offence. Is that right? That is correct. And at that time, he was about 15. I would say, yes, he was. Yep. So not having been in custody before, he was charged with a property-related offence and remanded into the detention centre, and two weeks later, this happened. Yes. Yes, thank you. Terry, thank you very much for the evidence. Um, we know that this is not an easy process for you, or for Cara, for that matter. And yes, I think uh, perhaps for Aaron, but we appreciate that you've been prepared to share your experiences and Aaron's experiences with us and to share your suggestions for how things could be improved. I can assure you that uh, although we don't have the power as such to implement our recommendations, we're very conscious that any recommendations we make do need to be implemented. And there is a big difference between recommending things and actually putting them into practice. So that's something we're very conscious of and uh, we hope uh, we'll uh, prove in the fullness of time that uh, we understand what uh, can be done and what should be done. So thank you very much for all the assistance you've given to the Royal Commission. We greatly appreciate it. And I thank you for all you do. Um, I think it's great that we can have such missions and investigations and have that opportunity to share experience. Thank you, Terry. Your time too. Mr. Griffin, do we take a short adjournment now? Take the morning break if we could, Chair. All right. Well, it, it's now um, 10.50 Perth time. We'll resume at 11.05. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. The Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, uh, Ms. McMahon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair and Commissioners, you'll now hear from Megan Cracker, who is the Director of the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project. Ms. Cracker will give an affirmation. Yes, uh, Ms. Cracker, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. Uh, we appreciate the assistance you're giving to the uh, Commission, we have your statement for which we also thank you, which we have had the opportunity to read. Um, if you would be good enough to follow the instructions of uh, Commissioner Mason's associate, she will administer the affirmation to you. And uh, then I'll ask Ms. McMahon to ask you some questions. Sure. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Uh, Ms. Krakow, just uh, so you're aware, as you know, uh, Commissioners Mason and McEwen are in the Perth hearing room, as is Ms. McMahon, whom you can also see. I am participating in the hearing from our Sydney hearing room, and so I'm joining remotely. Yes, Ms. McMahon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 
Ms Cracker, you, as you were introduced, you're the Director of the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project. Before we commence, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks for that. So I'm a Noongar person from Benin country. I have a large family, 13 brothers and sisters, and we have families all across Noongar country and very much over into Victoria as well, so very large extended family. Um, I just want to give evidence today, also standing up for the most marginalised and vulnerable people in our community, black, white and brown brothers, having the extensive knowledge working in the prison system, but also around homelessness, incarceration, deaths in custody, child removals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Cracker. And I'm, I'm going to give you a, a warning early to please slow down um, today with your evidence because of uh, our, in, our interpreters and so our wider audience can follow along. Um, now, Ms Cracker, you have provided a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 16th of September 2022. I understand there is one correction that you wish to make to that statement. And Commissioners, that's at paragraph 20. Um, <coughs> the sentence commencing with the words, I'm of the opinion, from my observations of the prisons and detention centres I have been to, that they are, and you wish to insert the word not, that's before correct. culturally safe environments. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, with that amendment being made, is that statement otherwise true and correct? Yes, it is. Thank you. Just by way of background, if I can just ask you to confirm that in addition to your role as director, you have attained a law degree from Deakin University. That's correct. You've also worked as an Aboriginal engagement officer with No More Legal Service, which was established in response to the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child abuse. That's correct. You've also worked as a critical outreach responder in Western Australia with the National Indigenous Critical Response Service. That's correct. And in 2020, you were appointed to the Western Australian Department of Corrective Services Suicide Prevention Task Force. That's correct, following the five deaths of Aboriginal people in Western Australia in custody in prison system. Thank you. Now, if you could just give a brief overview of the work of the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project, please. Thank you for that. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the country that we're on today is Wajuk country, um, where I come from is Manan country. So Perth around this area is not from where I am, where I come from. I'd like to also pay homage and respect to a person who I grow, that I have grown so much admiration and respect for and so much learnings and working together and fighting and advocating for some of the most marginalised and vulnerable. And that's my colleague, Jerry Georgiades, um, extensive work experience, particularly with going to 600 remote communities or 1,200 remote communities right across the country. So together in the last three years, we've worked with 21,000 people right across the country, the most marginalised, the most vulnerable, the critically vulnerable. And what makes our work so different is that there's a three approach. That's the intense psychosocial support, the assertive outreach and the 24 seven. So always being available to a lot of the families um, the work that we do is really extensive in terms of the intense psychosocial support. That's lacking from the West Australian mental health plan in Western Australia right now, hence the number of people that are taking their lives. Within the last five weeks, we've had two Aboriginal men come out of a prison unsupported, both dead to suicide. We can't continue to have this, and that's why the conditions in relation to incarceration need to be seriously abated so our people are given the same opportunities as everyone else and that place is not so much about punitive but about rehabilitation and restorative justice that is being failed. Ms um, Rekha, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm, I, I don't want to stop your flow at all or the content of what you're saying, but if you could just slow down a little bit for our you. interpreters. Thank you. Please continue. I assure you, you're not the first witness uh, who's had to slow down. It's a general experience we've had and I know it's uh, sometimes mm. a little difficult so but yeah, if you yeah. wouldn't mind it just makes it easier for us uh, to thank you that. um i know um miss cracker has worked with um aboriginal language interpreters who don't speak english um and that in that regard you have to speak in blocks it can't be a run that might assist miss cracker because the Auslan interpreters are um silent in that regard um but you have to speak in a block and then wait 
um, so that the interpreter can catch up. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. So the work is really extensive. The work is extensive because we have to go to people's homes. Yes. Because it's important. A lot of the critical vulnerable will not walk in the doors of a service. So we have to go to families. And the families that we go to, there's a multi uh, multifactorial of issues. And we work through those expertly and methodically, but also with the love and the care and the respect that these families deserve that are downtrodden and that don't have voices of their own to speak in ways that should. And too often the families, they're not heard, they're not validated, they're not listened to. And therefore, how can Department of Corrective Services, Department of Justice, the government for this, um, with the Mark McGowan leadership, how can they put in place workable strategies if it is not known? And that's where I'm seriously concerned in terms of raising the eleva elevating the deficit discourse of those that are being harmed, those that are being hurt, those that are being violated, and sadly, those families who are now dealing with a death to suicide after custody. Thank you, Ms Cracker. I just wanted to confirm the work that you're currently doing with the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project, that's voluntary work? That's correct. So it's, it's not funded, all of this work that you're doing with families um, and people in detention and prison currently, is that right? That's correct. It's about providing that love and support to the families who don't get their help. Sure, it'd be great to be funded because what we do actually do save lives and it does improve life circumstances because you have to be that beacon of light. Too many of our families uh, do not have that light, do not have that hope, and that's why we need to reach. Now, in terms of it not being funded, I mean, sorry, sorry, excuse me. That's the indictment of the West Australian government and they should be ashamed of themselves for not funding things that do work. And I'll give you two, two um Two examples at Acacia Prison and also Banksy Hill, where the approach worked, where children did not return into Banksy Hill, and that there were less suicides and self harm, no suicides, sorry, and less self harms as a result of the approach that we took. And Ms. Cracker, what I actually want to do is to go through each of those models um, in, in detail and in fact now. Um, so I want to focus first of all on the work that you and Jerry Georgiatis, his daughter, and also the psychologist that you worked with. Um, and I understand that this came about as a result of um, three deaths in um, custody, Aboriginal men um, at Acacia Prison. And you were in fact approached by senior staff at the jail to come in and do some work. Is that right? Almost. So in terms of Circo, they had made contact with my colleague, Jerry George Artis, because of all the, um, because he's been very active in media. And in fact, he's a great human rights champion and very well known across the country. That's how the contact was made. Now, in terms of Acacia Prison, yes, there were three Aboriginal people that passed away in a period of um, three years, two to source, one year, sorry, three to, let me start again. There were three Aboriginal men who passed away at Acacia Prison within one year, two to suicide and one to a natural death. In fact, that one year, there were five Aboriginal people that passed away in Western Australian prisons, three in Acacia Prison, one dear soul rest in peace at Malaluka Prison and the other at Robin Regional Prison. And it's the case, isn't it, that there was a contract um, for initially six months to do um, work with people who either had self-harmed or who were at risk of self-harm and then that contract was extended for two months which meant that you worked in Acacia Prison from October 2020 to June 2021 is that correct? That's correct. And I also understand that that work was on a full-time basis you and Jerry um, and, and his daughter uh, providing administration support and that meant and please correct me if I'm wrong that you were in the jails most days, sometimes more than five days a week, between 8 and 4 p.m., 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., but then you also worked after hours with family and other services. Is that right? That's correct. So in terms of the... Yes, Cracker, can I just ask this? Um, Circo, what, what's Circo's role at the prison? Is this a privatised prison or does Circo That's... have some management role or what? That's correct. So Circo is um, the only private prison in Western Australia. 
and they manage and run Acacia Prison. I see. Thank you. They're contracted by the department. Yeah. Thank you. So in terms of the setup for your work, before I start talking about the detail of the services you provided, were you provided space to work on a full-time basis within the prison? Um, we were. That didn't happen until about four weeks of us arriving at Acacia Prison. And then we started working in Oscar Block. And in Oscar Block, they had a multiple of services like resettlement um, and many others. And a lot of the programs were being run from Oscar Block. Yes. So that was very central and that it, therefore it made it very easy to come into contact with the gentleman at the prison. And so in terms of access to prisoners, that wasn't an issue for you because of the, the nature of the work you were contracted to do inside the prison. Is that right? That's correct. So if you needed to see someone, you could see them. That's correct. Um, we had a strong relationship and bearing in mind that I was on the um, Suicide Prevention Task Force with the Department of Corrective Services. Um, we'd had strong relationships with the director at the um, CERCO and the amount of work that we did out in the community in relation to responding to suicides, um, helping and supporting families, um, <laughs> advocating with families when there had been a challenge, for example, with um, Lacey Harrison and with her daughter, Denisha Woods, so a lot of families knew who we were, so therefore we had the strong relationship, the credibility, the reputation to help and support families. So in terms of having access to people in a prison, it was, it was really good. They were accessible um, and we could go to the units. We would go down to the detention unit where there were behavioural issues and speak to each and every single person who was in those hobbles of human miseries for hours and days on end. The same thing applied with a medical unit where we first came into contact with a young Aboriginal man who had self-harmed the very first day that we arrived. Can I, can I ask you about that, that particular course. example in a moment? Because I really want to focus on, sure. on that first example. Is that okay if of I do course. that later? Um, but I just want to understand some of the relationship issues first. So it sounds as though from what you're saying that you had um, strong relationships with um, all staff at, at all levels, but also that there was a level of cooperation with staff and the work you needed to do. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, something I want to um, ask you about is about the Prague meeting. So that's the Prisoner Risk Assessment Group meetings. Now, my understanding is that they were meetings that were held daily um, that you and Jerry were invited to. Who else was at the table of those meetings? At the table, there were unit managers, there were also psychologists, there were key people in the, in the prison, um, also some of the Aboriginal liaison officers. It just depended who very much went to the Prague meeting. So a lot of family, a lot of people in the prison system, like for example, the Aboriginal engagement officers and us to some degree, if there was a family that we were caring for, that we were helping, that we were supporting, we would turn up to those Prague meetings and work in partnership to ensure that there was a plan going forward. So that meant if there was a person, as with the case which we'll get to shortly, um, from two hour watch to four hour watch, and basically we were trying to help this young man move back out to the general population. That's what that's what the purpose of that Prague meeting. The other thing too is just because we have the relationships with so many in the communion, I bear in mind 21,000 people right across the country that aren't being supported and are focusing on Noongar country. Um, those relationships were built. So as a result, a lot of families, a lot of the people in the prison system would tell us things which ordinarily wouldn't be told to anyone else. Yes. And also we had the contacts with the families on the outside, so they were known to us. And that makes a difference in terms of saving lives and improving life circumstances that rapport, that care, that love, that respect, that is what's missing from the prison system in Western Australia and, and indeed the 132 prisons right across this country today. And what, what you're talking about there, am, am I right to say that because of um, your relationships with the prisoners you're working with, but also because of the cultural safety that you were bringing to those communications with First Nations men with disability, that they were making disclosures to you about traumas that they might not have um, made to other people. Is that right? 
That's exactly right. And sorry, yes. And there were times when we would we would tell the family what was the individual, what was happening on the outside with their family. And I refer to two young boys who passed away at the Swan River. They're one of the boys, rest in peace, his father is up at Acacia Prison and he was at the time and still there today. But one of the other boys that passed away, his older brother was also in Acacia Prison. So we were able to communicate and say, look, there's a coroner's inquest. Um, and I thank the National Justice Project for running that case. There's a coroner's inquest. There's going to be a lot of media this week. We had to make them prepared. So as a result, we'd organise visits for the family to come prior to it and make sure that there was support for the younger person in particular, knowing that he was going to see details of his brother drowning at that particular time and that would be televised. So that's a relationship and a correlation that we had with the people in the prison system. They trusted and respect and cared about our work because we cared about them. And, and that, is it not an example of holistic care in terms of understanding what's happening for that prisoner at that point in time for them individually and responding to that? That's correct. And bringing that calm, the calm has to be brought into the prison and that's with true understanding and and that, that love and redemptorous approach. So without the love and the calmness, and the peace that we brought into that prison by listening and hearing and validating trauma and disabling trauma, people can't move past that because a lot of the families and a lot of the individuals in that particular prison, they had so many, so many issues. There was so much unaddressed trauma and with unaddressed trauma, it needs to be expertly worked through in a methodical, caring, loving way so you can disable the trauma and develop pathways forward. It's about hearing, listening, acting and being genuine. Now, before I continue, I just um, wanted to confirm with you that many of the men that you were working with, First Nations um, and non-First Nations people, were people with disability? That's correct. And that there was a high proportion, as I understand it, from your evidence um, of people you were working with who did have disability? That's correct. Okay. Now... In turn, we, we've, you've touched on um, cultural safety. There's two elements of cultural safety I, I just want to ask you about. And the first one you refer to at paragraph 40 of your statement about touch. Now, the prisons, sorry, the prison staff in your work at Acacia, they allowed you, did they not, to sometimes hug a prisoner, touch their hands um, and so forth when you thought that was appropriate? That's correct. Can you just explain to the commissioners and the wider audience about the significance of touch from a cultural perspective and, and why, if it is the case, you think that should be allowed in the context of supporting people? Of course. So Acacia Prison, as you know, that's a, that's a prison which is largely and hugely populated. There's about 1,500 men at any one time. Um, of that, when we were there, there was about 525 Aboriginal men that were in prison. Um, we'd worked with 1,200 people and substantively 400 people. Because we showed that kindness and that caring approach, that touch is really quite important. The, sorry, the hand, on the, sh the hand on the shoulder, the shake in the hand, the embrace, it brings that human side in terms of the compassion and the love and the respect. And that can actually bring so much calm to a person's life because all of a sudden they know that someone's there, they care about you. Yes, we all make mistakes. Some people make mistakes that just shouldn't be done, but it does happen. And that's why I believe in the redemption. But in terms of the touch, that was important because some of the families that we were working with, they had lost family on the outside to suicide or an unnatural death or you know, one of their elders may have passed away. You see an Aboriginal person for the very first time, brother, I'm sorry about what happened to your auntie or your uncle or your little niece or nephew. It's about that respect and the respect has to be embedded, which it is not at this point, throughout the whole entire criminal justice system to make sure that our people are given a fair go and that we're, that we're not subjected to any more violence that's being perpetrated right now, which is causing harm, and I'll go so far and say death. And in terms of bringing 
the qualities of communication that you're you're talking about. Um, is it your view that community-based organisations such as your own um, and others that you that you've listened to in this hearing over the week should be allowed access to provide that sort of support to people with disability? Hundred percent, hundred percent, and that's what's missing. That is a missing link in the prison system, and then too often we leave people feeling isolated, alone not cared for, not provided the appropriate supports and equipment to live a normal life in the prison system. So we're denying some of our most vulnerable people in the prison system access to the very fundamentals that we should all have as human beings in this world. Now, Ms. Croco, um, in your statement, you talk about the yarning approach and indeed we've heard evidence um, on other days in this hearing about the benefits, real fundamental benefits of that approach of communication. But I want to ask you about the spaces that were available for you to um, conduct that sort of communication with your clients. Were corrective services flexible with you about being able to use whatever space you need to communicate in the way that you, you needed to? For example, Sorry, on, are we you, talking about Acacia, the prison Acacia? Uh, Acacia. Yes, all of these questions are on Acacia, um, if I... I should not say. Sure, I'm not sure it's the department, is it? It might be Circo. I don't know. Sorry, the, the staff at the prison, I mm. should say. Um, for example, in terms of flexibility, sitting on the ground or, or whatever, you know, in open spaces with sunlight, were those sort of, that sort of flexibility open to you? There was incredible leadership at Acacia Prison and he understood the nature of the work that we did and he saw the calm that we managed to bring into the prison by our approach. So having access to the units, having access to the de detention unit, which you know people were placed, um, having all access in the prison, it was really good. Now there was a man who had contact, who had approached me because he heard me speak about sexual abuse and my work that I'd done with No More Legal Service as part of the Royal Commission into Institutional Response to Child Sexual Abuse. And this was a beautiful, strong Aboriginal man, but he had so much unaddressed trauma but he heard me speak of it in a group. And he said to me, he says, can I have a yarn with you? And I said, yeah, no worries, brother. And I said, where do you want to go? You want to go outside? We'll sit on the grass outside and we'll talk. And that exactly is what happened. And, you know, it was in, I'm pretty smart in terms of a prison system, know what I can do and what I can't do. And we just sat, we listened to each other, we talked. And for the very first time, he spoke about his child sexual abuse, which has been haunting him since he was five, six years of age. In terms of the space, as mentioned earlier part, um, there was a period of about four or five weeks where we didn't have a space. So we're trying to make room for us going into the contract. But when we did get that space, we had one small room. And Jerry, myself, um, young Connie, who also worked with us, and also the psychologists who came in once every week, we were very popular. So sometimes there'd be two, three, four people trying to get our help in the room. And then there would be three, four, five, six in the hallways on the outside. So in terms of adequate spacing, we did have a room, but it wasn't fit for the work that we were carrying out. I see. Now, I'd like to walk through some of the elements of the services that you provided. Um, I'm just conscious of time, so I won't, we won't be able to go into great detail for each element, but I want to draw um, some particular information from each element. Um, and I, Commissioners, paragraph 37 of Megan, uh, Ms. Cracker's statement really does detail the services. Now, first is um, intense support. Now, I just wanna read the case study um, that I've, uh, well, before I do, I might just ask you if you could just briefly indicate what you mean by the words intense support, because they're deliberate words that you, you use in the context of your service. That's correct. So intense support is going over and above what you would do for your child, what any other individual would do for their child or their husband or their uncle or their, their nephew and working through their needs catering for each and every single need to take the person to a better place. And that's where the validation comes through, unpacking those issues in such a way 
where there is that validation so you can disable and that's where the assertive outreach comes into play. But in terms of the intense psychosocial support, advocating, giving hope, practical support, um, you know, the, the radical transformation and the radical empathy very much paramount to overturning the key failures with the prison system right now. And when you talk about radical empathy, just so others can understand the terms that you use, I understand that to be fa a fast approach. Is, is that what is that a part of the element of radical empathy? That's correct. We work with so many people and we do work unfunded. Yeah. So you have to show empathy and you need to show people that you care and that's why people open up to you and be way more receptive. A group that do it really well over here in Western Australia is the Nullamay Aboriginal Corporation. My nephew's in the room right now. But it's about giving people hope and practical hope. So I'll give you that by way of just a short example. A young... Uh, a young Aboriginal man who spent at least 20 years in the prison system and we'd engaged with him in the prison system. Um, my colleague, Jerry, who was approached by resettlement, said he's getting out in two days. Uh, we haven't got accommodation. Jerry found accommodation for this young man. But he also came out of prison without any birth certificate. Mm. He had no photo ID except for a little piece of, that, piece of paper that Department of Corrective Services give you upon release. Um, so I was very limited. So I'd picked him up from the prison system and I'd taken him to the Nullamay Aboriginal Corporation. And straight away, they put him on a program. In that program, nine different certificates we got within a two-week period. All the while, we, I took him down to his accommodation. And prior to doing that, making sure that he had a bank account so his Centrelink payments could go into it. When a person is in the prison system, after two or three years, their bank accounts close. So that's really problematic, people coming out of the prison system without that. So being able to provide all these practical measures, and now this man, who ordinarily would have returned, in his words, back to prison, is now stable with his mum, and he's working. Now, you've just given an example of one of the elements of um, the support you give, which is safety plans and post-release planning. Um, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, now, just in terms of the intense support, I just wanted to read that example that we referred to much earlier in your evidence. And this is on page seven of Ms Cracker's statement. For example, on our first day of work at Acacia, we were approached by the superintendent to go and visit a man who had seriously self-harmed. When we went to see him, he was sullen, sad, and depressed. I sat down on the floor with him and just said, what's going on with you, darling? What can I do? He just started crying and he told us about what he was going through. He immediately had a strong resonance with Jerry and I knew, sorry, and I, because we knew his family on the outside. He and others in the prison viewed us as community people who cared, not prison people. Prison officers didn't have a relationship with him and he didn't trust them. Jerry and I would go back and see him every day. We connected him to legal assistance and he has stayed in contact with us since he got out of prison. That's correct. That obviously draws a lot of the elements um, of the sort of support you're providing yeah. um, as set out in your statement. That's correct. And so in terms of that assertive outreach, so while some services, they only operate, you know, I'm not referring to all, but some between eight and five, that wasn't our lot. That wasn't our mandate. We operated above that. So I'll give you one more quick example. A man had problems with contacting his woman, his missus. He said, I don't know where she is. I don't know what she's doing. Can you? And he, it was causing him a lot of anxiety and stress. So I said, brother, what's her address? I know who she is. I'll go around and see her. So I did go and see her. And this is after hours. I went and caught up with her. And I said, hey, your man's stressing out in the prison there. And um, he wants your number if that's all right. And it was no issue. She gave me the number and I gave it to him when I went back there. But I also took this woman after making a visit um, to Acacia Prison. 
and that brought calm to him and his life. It's just about treating people with human kindness and love and dignity, and that is missing from the prison system, as I previously mentioned. And sorry, can I, I just yes. sorry, sorry uh, Ms. McMahon, I'd just like to ask Ms. Cracker a question here. The example that Ms. McMahon read out uh, that occurred on your first day of work at Acacia. Was that your first day of work after you'd been contracted by Serco to work at the centre? That's correct. That you say it. in paragraph 23 that the contract was initially for six months, but was extended by two months. Was there any reason that Serco didn't extend it beyond eight months altogether? Um, thank you. So there was budgetary, budgetary issues. And I think there may have been um, some internal politics that was happening as a result. Commissioner, myself and my colleague, we're behind a class action against Banksy Hill right now, and we've collected 600 testimonies right across the state of Western Australia about the harm that has been perpetrated. And we're in contact with many families. So because we didn't want to see any more human suffering and pain, um, we've teamed up with Levitt Robinson solicitors in Victoria, in, in Sydney, and we're hearing the details of every single abuses and atrocities that have been inflicted upon younger and older. Banksy Hill has, was established in 1997. There's been 10,000 people that have gone through there. And right now in Western Australia, we have one in 12 Aboriginal men that are in prison today. So we needed to abate the crisis that is hurting and killing people. Yeah, so you think that uh, those actions on your part had something to do with the contract not being renewed? I'm sorry, Commissioner, I didn't hear that. Yeah, uh, you, in your, to your understanding, it's your activities uh, relating to Banksia Hill that may have had something to do with Serco not renewing your contract for Acacia. That's correct. All right, okay, that, that, that's what I wanted to understand. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Cracker, just in terms of the example that I just read out um, of the person that you assisted on your first day and other prisoners that you assisted, were any of them, did they need to be strip searched before you had contact with them? No, no, they didn't because we were working in the prison. Um, no one had to be strip searched. Whereas if you come in for a visit from the outside, it's known that people coming, the prisoners coming to the visits, they do need to be strip searched. Thank you. And just that, ex just that example you gave about um, going to see the partner of the prisoner who was really anxious about non-contact, did that have a, a de-escalation um, impact upon him in terms of his mental health or what he was going through? Absolutely, it did. I mean, it brought peace and calm to his life and he was able to communicate with people outside of the prison system that he loved and cared for. And that brought a lot of, um, it, it de-escalated many situations and he still has a strong relationship with us today. And even though he's not released, he's still in the St Goldfields Regional Prison. I hear from him on a regular basis and he calls me his best friend. Okay. So that's okay. Um, and can I just ask some of that other work that you're doing where you're going into the community, dealing with issues that's making prisoners anxious? <coughs> Chuck some water. Thank you. Um, family members and other issues that are, are making prisoners anxious. Are you finding that that is important to de-escalating and settling prisoners? Absolutely. It is very important. A lot of families on the outside do not know what's happening with their loved ones on the inside. There is a lack of, sorry, let me slow down. There is a lack of communication. Um, after the riots, which happened in Acacia Prison, several months after we left, which where men were on the roofs and, you know, it was just, um, it was just catastrophic. A lot of families did not know what was happening to their loved one and it caused a lot of tension mm. and hurt. And there is a fail over here because in Western Australia, we have departments of corrective services, of course, and then they have the Aboriginal visitor scheme. 
and the Aboriginal and Visitors Scheme was a recommendation from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. They do not have enough Aboriginal people working in the prison system to help and support. So that's a massive fail, fail and there is lack of communication um, and the families do get stressed out, not knowing if someone has self-harm, if someone had been hurt. Um, there were cases in that particular situation where I was getting contacted around the clock myself, um, my colleague Jerry George Artis and my nephew Mervyn Heats who runs Nalamaya, what's going on with our loved one? We haven't heard nothing. We don't know if they're getting flogged. We don't know if they're getting bashed. We, we've heard that they're sleeping on the floor and this is one particular unit at Acacia Prison several months after we left, sleeping, sorry, sleeping on the floors on mattresses, the allegations were rubbish. Um, some of the Aboriginal people working at the Acacia Prison at that point weren't able to go and have access to these men and bring this calm and communicate back into the um, into the family. And that's why there's a lot of hate and animosity towards this system that breaks and deprives us of our liberty and our freedom and our ways to get better. Now, I, I want to, um, I'm just conscious of the time. We have a little over 15 minutes or so. Um, and I wanna talk about Banksia as well. But before we conclude on Acacia, um, could you, I know that it hasn't been evaluated, the work that you've done that independently, but can you speak to some of the outcomes as you see them um, as a result of your work? Sure, thank you. When we first walked into Acacia Prison, I spoke of a situation with a harm of one young man, but within the first quarter, and bearing in mind that there had been three Aboriginal people that had passed away within a one year period. And one of the matters is in, um, in well, basically in a coroner's inquest right now with another couple of days in December. But we'd taken self-harms from 33 to three within one quarter, within one quarter. We've done something so remarkable and the feedback from the people in the prison system and their families was incredible. Incredible because we'd applied such a humane process and approach to dealing with people at risk and people in the system. So, you know, we were very fortunate uh, because of the extensive experiential that we have and the experience that we have. But it was, a, it was an amazing experience. But in terms of the outcomes, mm. yeah, the, the prison system, the people that we'd come into contact with, we, with providing that practical support, referring to the Aboriginal Legal Service, referring to this one, that one that could be done really quite quickly. We saw more calm. We'd seen 33 self harms calm down to three within a very short period of time. We saw a lot of people um, who had previously had issues with Department of Child Protection, um, which I'll talk to shortly, um, have more access to their children. We saw more people leave the prison system because we'd supported parole plans by way of doing support letters. And in fact, writing parole plans for some of these um, um, gentlemen in the prison, they were getting out and not returning. And those ones were going into full-time employment. The Nullamaya program I referred to, over 400 people from the prison system have gone there. Um, many are employed today. And in fact, 18 now are buying their homes. So this is a radical transformation. The radical empathy is very much missing from the prison system. Cope all that with the assertive outreach, which is 24 seven, so you can help and respond. The out, I mean, it was just incredible. And I can tell you this right now, that was my favorite job ever by working and caring about these fellas and helping them. The other thing too, um, just going up there Christmas day, one of the fellas, he said to me, what are you doing up here? Shouldn't you be with your family? My response was, yeah, I am with my family. You buggers are in here. So it's about loving and caring about others. Mm. But we had enormous outcomes um, and, you know, outcomes that I've never seen before. And I was very fortunate because I was working with, of course, Jerry and Jerry to me and He's an expert prison reformist, and that's why we had the results there. 
at the same time at Banksy Hill with very vulnerable cohorts. And I, I, wanna, I wanna move on to Banksia, but I just have one more question about Acacia. Did you think that your presence, your and Jerry and, and Connie and, and the psychologist's presence within the jail on a full-time basis either did or had capacity to impact the culture of the prison staff at Acacia? Absolutely, it did. And because people saw what we did worked, people saw the respect that we gave to many, people saw that we were involved in coronial inquests on the outside and the calm that we brought to the people on the inside. So the respect was there. Everything is all about education. People need to be educated in terms of ways of working with Aboriginal people. And in fact, non Indigenous people too. Don't be judgmental unless you've walked in their shoes because you don't know their stories better than them. So, um, yeah. We had a remarkable outcome. Thank you. Now, in February 2020, you and um, uh, Jerry were granted a one off funding to provide um, support and uh, for an eight week period to girls at Banksia Hill. And I understand that the majority, from your evidence, um, of girls that you supported were living with disability, including FASD and cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. and many or perhaps most you can tell us um, experienced a trauma background as well? Sure so yeah a lot of the young girls that we worked with and bear in mind that there were 18 young girls when we first walked in eight weeks later when we left there was seven and no one had returned and that was because of the approach that I talked about. Can I just interrupt you I didn't catch that number and I think it's a significant one. Sorry. You said there were 18 girls when you. <coughs> Sorry just getting over no. a cough. So there were 18 young girls at the time that we entered Yida. So Yida is where the young girls were accommodated. Yes. When we left eight weeks later, there were seven young girls and there was intense support and a wraparound that was provided to these young people um, to ensure that the safety nets were there because a lot of the young girls were going back into very, very weak safety nets and even completing bail was a massive challenge and that's why we have a lot of people returning to the prison system because they can't comply with some of the bail conditions which are imposed. Can I please just um, list some of the elements, if you could confirm um, what you were doing and then perhaps give some more detail afterwards. Sure. So the support that you were providing was um, you were applying similar elements that you did at Acacia? Exactly Is that right? the same approach. And so the supports that you were providing were individual and tailored to the, to the person, to the young girl? That's correct. You were writing um, culturally appropriate background reports for girls for bail and parole, is that right? That's correct. Um, you were connecting the girls to housing and support other supports for release. That's correct. You were actively involved in developing safety plans. Individually, yes. And you were assisting with release applications for these girls. Is there any other detail that you'd like to tell the commissioners about how you were supporting the girls? When we were first, it was a very rushed decision to get us in there. And that was when it, when coronavirus was heightened over here in Western Australia. The majority of services, if not all, had pulled out of Banksy Hill because of the coronavirus and there was the rolling lockdowns. And we finally got our Guernsey to go in, not to babysit, but to care and basically show the way forward in terms of restorative justice and rehabilitation. The young girls that we'd spoken to, we, you know, it was put on us. Do you want an office? No, we don't want an office. We want to work amongst where the young girls are so we can help and support them and we have that presence. Each and every single young girl we had that conversation with, we had strong conversations and, you know, we'd have laughter and kindness and there were some girls in there with some tragic circumstances where there was child sexual abuse, the, the disabilities in terms of ADHD and the FASD and, you know, the autism and so forth. Some of these young children, they were subjected to that. But in terms of detailing it, some of the, it is a poverty narrative in Western Australia. So we took into that account when working with the young girls and we gave that hope. And we gave hope in practical means and that meant strengthening their safety plans for when they were going back into community. 
We must also remember that with, with Banksia Hill, there are 40% of young children in Banksia Hill are in the care of Department of Child Protection who are failing our people no end. So 70, between 64 to 70% of people that go from Banksia Hill end up in adult carceral estate, and that's why we need to abate the current crisis and the situation. But what we did different, we sat, we listened, we validated, we disabled, and we set about positive pathways, all these young ones, and we did it with the most kindness and loving approach. Um, Jerry and I, we've got 11 degrees between us, so we know how to switch our talk. We've been experienced with dealing with many cohorts right across the country. Um, in terms of Aboriginal people, we are very diverse. So knowing what you can say, what you can't say, the cultural cues, but at every single stage of engagement, that love and that respect, and we had many young girls cry on us because for the first time they talked about their child sexual abuse. For the first time they talked about the atrocities and the hurt that was being perpetrated in their homes that they were returning to. Some spoke of the hurt and the harm that they were receiving in care homes, group homes, where Department of Child Protection was placing these kids and the kids would run away because they didn't want to be there because of um, the environment. So this is my experience and I must stand up and speak my truth for the thousands of people that I represent, not only across the country, but in Western Australia, our brothers and sisters need immediate intervention in terms of how departments of um, communities, Department of Corrective Services, Department of Justice, and in fact, the McGowan government continue to oppress our people. We examine the oppressor all the time, or the oppressed, but what about the oppressor that's perpetrating this harm and violence against our people? It can't continue. Ms Cracker, um, I just have some a, a couple of general questions before um, I just want to ask if you had any recommendations and then the commissioners will ask you some questions. Um, Banksia Hill is the only detention centre in WA. Um, in your view, from a cultural perspective in particular, if you start from the assumption that detention centres will continue to exist, um, where should they be located? Is it acceptable, I suppose, for there to be one and to be located if there are going to be detention centres, it can't just be down here in Noongar country. We have children coming from remote locations from the Kimberley, some children coming from remote locations in the Pilbara, children coming from remote locations in um, the Eastern Goldfields. So it can't just be down here in Western Australia because that's a fail. Because some of these children, they are speaking different languages from other regions of Western Australia and they don't have the adequate resourcing that is happening right um, in that place right now. So, but in terms of Casarina Prison, where 20, where 18 young people were sent to on the 20th of July, 12 of those young children had disabilities. They were diagnosed with the FASD and so forth. And we've had engagement with these children. We've had engagement with these families and they're crying for help. But in terms of those children and the strong conversations we've had, six young people, six young people have seriously self-harmed. Three of those young people have had to be resuscitated. The department is not transparent with the information which needs to be in real-time data. It can't just be about waiting for a a year or two years when the Inspector for Custodial Services finally releases his report, because after then the fact is over and done with. We need real-time data, and that would be one of the strongest recommendations that I make that is published on the Department of Corrective Services website as to the occurrences in terms of self-harm, the um, disabilities, it needs to be present on their website. So there is that accountability, that transparency, um, in real time data. That is something that is being denied to us on the outside and also denied to the families. So I take fire and I take harm, um, take home at the way that there are problems in this system and these systems and these problems have been known for years, known for years. And what we're going to see is some of the evidence which 
um, which is going to dress it up in terms of some statistical data, but we see it, we hear it, we breathe it, we feel it with the families and the children. One young child who was released from Banks, Banks Unit 18, he said to me this morning, he, really, he was released two days ago and his matter was heard by the Honourable Justice Quayle and I was in the courtroom that day. He said he was locked down for 22 hours a day. And I said to him, darling, what about the education? He said, I went to school after three or four weeks because there was nothing available. And I said, well, what did that look like? And he said to me, oh, sometimes like um, I went for 30 minutes, sometimes a day, or oh, sometimes 30 minutes, sometimes an hour. I said, how often was that? Oh, like two times a week, like seriously. Our children are being failed and I cannot accept the failures, particularly when it's going to lead and cause harm to our people and so much so death. A young boy, he was hanging, hanging at, a, at unit 18. That should never have happened. This young boy has got so much trauma his mum and dad were killed in a car accident in 2015. His matter went to a coronial inquest in 2020. So I have to question those that have disabilities, where is the occupational therapist? There is none. There is none out at Unit 18. We have Banksy Hill. They're already staffing problems at one location. Now we have two locations two locations. So the rolling lockdowns, which the departments and others will say, well, this is problematic. Well, when are they going to fix it? Who are the adults here? Yes. It's not the children. Fix these problems so it doesn't become an issue next year, the year after, the year after, so these children can get the um, correct supports that they need. And even the move to Banks, from Banksy Hill to Casarina Prison, some of the children, they had to give their permission to go across in the first instance. Some of these children have cognitive disabilities and impairments, and they're making decisions to go across to a place where there is lack of support, lack of support with people in terms of um, disabilities. But the other thing, if a child, and this has been one of the criticisms, if a child has to go to a confidential room, which I've heard that there's none, there needs to be three or four staff that take that child from one place to the next. So the staffing lockdowns, the department needs to grow up and they need to ensure that this does not become a problem. So all people in the prison system are given the opportunity to have that proper restorative justice, that proper rehabilitation, and bring that love into a prison system. Don't be so sensitive when we have programs that do work but because of Banksy Hill class actions, thanks to Levitt Robinson and yes. Jerry George Artis, that we are unfavorable. We are not the bad guys here. We are sticking up for our government. I think, I think we might just pause there, if you don't mind. Thank just you. Just ask Ms McMahon if she's got any further questions to put um, to you. I, that could be I, done now. Thank you, Chair. I just had one question, and then um, I'd like to ask the hand over to Chair. Um, and that is... With regards to um, the development of Banksy Hill's operating philosophy, I just want to know whether or not any organ First Nations organisations that you've been involved in or have connections to, whether or not um, they have been consulted with regards to that philosophy. No, if you could just keep that. No, they haven't. I've mixed it no. with a lot of families of young ones in the prison system and older. Nothing, okay. nothing whatsoever to select for you. Thank you. Um, Chair, do commissioners have any questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, I will ask uh, my colleagues, if it's all right with you, Ms. Krakow, to, if they have any uh, questions, and I'll start with Commissioner Mason. Um, Ms. Krakow, thank you very much for your evidence today. <clears throat> um, one of the recommendations um, in your statement is about Aboriginal medical services having um, access to support people in custody just generally, what, what, what isn't happening now in terms of that access by the AMSs to, to support people in custody? 
section 19 of the, of the Health Insurance Act, the Commonwealth legislation that needs to be amended. It needs to be amended so the Aboriginal, Aboriginal medical services right across this country can go in and provide a safe, appropriate level of health care. And unless that amendment's done, then we won't see the Aboriginal medical services work in the prison and claim their Medicare rebate. That is a massive challenge and that will actually lead to less people dying in, in the prison system. That needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Commissioner McEwen if he has any questions for you. Uh, thank you. I have one question, Ms. Cracker. You talked about the how you began the program with um, Acacia Banksia Hill. You talked about relationship and that you were known to people in the prison, you knew their family, and you had connections with management. And we've heard in this Royal Commission, this hearing, that there's often a disconnect between frontline staff and the leadership management, and that's stopping the inmates from getting appropriate support. Mm -hmm. Did it sound like you had already personal connections that you were able to work with with management to get the work done, or was there something else? No, you're absolutely correct. We did have those relationships, and our work is known in community. Um, you know, there were no barriers in that sense to providing a support service to, to some of the most vulnerable men and children. So it's fair to say then that that should be the case for anything. Absolutely. What we're trying to do in, in this space in terms of getting this direct services to the inmate through um, cultural um, connection, through um, knowledge, through the relationship you built with the government and so forth. And that's correct. It's, it's basically a no-brainer in terms of providing that support and love to people that are very vulnerable. Um, you know, there's people in the, in the outside in the community that can do that type of work, but we don't get the opportunity. Um, strong advocates like Hannah McGlade, strong advocates like Mervyn Eads. But because we challenge the government on issues which causes harm, we're seen as the bad guys and we're not the bad people. We're the good people trying to make a difference and, and bring about that systemic repair, which is much needed to a terrible system hurting and killing people. Thank you, and thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you, appreciate your time. Uh, Mr Cracker, I just wanted to ask a question about paragraph 31 of your statement, where you refer to uh, your colleague and yourself conducting outreach to prisoners inside Acacia, <clears throat> and you refer to the Lima block which housed approximately 200 prisoners with disabilities and mental health issues. Can you uh, uh, just give us an, an indication of how Lima, Lima block is organized? Uh, the, who, how does a prisoner get into that block? What are the conditions? What are the restraints? If any, I don't necessarily mean physical restraints. What, yeah. what does this block look like? So in a case of prison, you have, you know, your blocks. There's the K block, which is Kilo. Then you have your M block, which is Mike. And Lima block, we see also a lot of people with mental health um, impairments. Um, they, there was a lot of medication that was provided to these, to these fellas. But, you know, there was cognitive impairments, the FASD, the ADHDs, the dyslexia. Um, they were some of the elements and disabilities that some of the men did have. So we spent a substantial amount of time in Lima, Bo Lima Block um, just helping and supporting. But, you know, there was only a few of us, so we tried other methods to help and support. That is one of the fails in terms of disabilities and the number of people going in there and providing the service. I, I, I understand, but I, I, was, I was just interested in the people who were actually in Lima Block. Are they selected to go in there because they've got disabilities of a particular kind is that how it works i believe so yes yeah. and the other and, yeah go on the other unit in acacia prison where um, it's kind of like a mini hospital so to speak and there's meant to be a much more higher level of care is foxtrot um foxtrot is where a member of our community took his life joven blanket rest in peace which is up here which right. has happened before the coroner's court. 
Yeah. Um, uh, those Pat people in Lima Block, um, they were selected, I believe, um, but it did have a cohort of people with specifically those types of disabilities and they needed yeah. more support. Thank you. Uh, look, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, the evidence you have given and for the statement that you've provided to us. Uh, you've uh, given us uh, some insights into how a different approach uh, to people in prison and particularly First Nations uh, people with disabilities might be assisted. And uh, we're very grateful to you for the suggestions you've made and for the description you've provided of uh, the services that uh, you've introduced into the, uh, these institutions. So we very much appreciate the assistance you've given us uh, and the ideas that you've presented to us. So thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, the distortion of the truth by some of the others, um, some of the organisations, department, it needs to stop because it is causing harm and it is killing people. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mac Ms McMahon, do we take a break now? Uh, yes, please. If we could have the lunch break now, Chair. However, um, would it be possible to come back at one o'clock Perth time rather than 10 past because of time constraints of one of our witnesses in the last panel? Yes, all right. Well, it's now 10 past 12 Perth time. We'll resume at 1 p.m. Perth time, which will be 3 p.m. Uh, Sydney time. Thank you, Chair. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. So fucking... <clears throat> the Royal Commission is now in session. Yes, Mr. Griffin. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, the next witnesses are three experts who will provide insight into some of the themes and issues canvassed in this public hearing from a human rights perspective. The first witness who's appearing by AVL is Kriti Sharma. She's made a statement dated the 9th of September, 2022. Ms Sharma is a senior disability rights researcher with Human Rights Watch, and she's giving evidence via AVL from Mauritius. I wish I was in Mauritius. <laughs> huh. Sorry. All right, car carry on, Mr. Griffin. Second witness is Deborah Kilroy, OAM. She's provided a statement dated the 12th of September, 2022. Yeah. She is the CEO of Sisters Inside <clears throat> and the principal of Kilroy and Callahan Lawyers. And the third witness is George Newhouse who's provided the statement dated the 9th of September, 2022. Mr. Newhouse is the adjunct professor of law at both Macquarie University and University of Technology in Sydney, and the director and CEO of the National Justice Project. Chair, I understand each witness will take an affirmation. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Sharma, Mr. Newhouse and Ms. Kilroy for uh, coming to the Royal Commission. In Ms. Sharma's case, not quite coming to the Royal Commission in order to give uh, evidence, but in any event, giving evidence. We're very grateful to each of you for the uh, statements that you have provided and which we have, uh, each of us has uh, read with great interest. Just to uh, ensure that you know where we all are, in the uh, Perth hearing room, we have Commissioner Mason and Commissioner McEwen. Of course, Mr. Griffin is also in the Perth hearing room, and I am joining the hearing uh, remotely from Sydney. Uh, if you would each be good enough uh, to follow the instructions of Commissioner Mason's associate, she will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please all say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. yes. 
I do. Thank you very Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll now ask Mr. Griffin to uh, ask you some questions. The commissioners, can I indicate that given the backgrounds and expertise of each of these witnesses, I can safely say they could speak for many hours on many of the issues we've been discussing. Unfortunately, we've only got a very short period of time this afternoon. In their statements, there are frequently detailed information and pertinent brief case studies to illustrate various points, which I commend to you, commissioners. For purposes of this session, I've asked the witnesses to indicate particular issues arising from their statements that they believe would benefit by further elaboration with oral evidence. And I thank them for their cooperation in that extent. The approach I intend to take is I will nominate usually a particular panelist to give the first response to any question I ask, and then give the other panelists the opportunity to agree, disagree, or comment on the primary answer. But can I begin by asking what I might refer to as a universal question? Members of the panel, this Royal Commission has heard this week and has received in written documents an observation particular from the Inspector of Custodial Services in relation to the Banksia Hill Detention Centre, that the centre lacks an overriding philosophy. And can I ask each of you in turn to give the benefit of your experience to the commissioners. If one was creating a juvenile detention centre and to a certain extent a prison, what would the overriding philosophy look like? What would be its characteristics based on your experience? And I can, can I start with you, Ms. Sharma? Sure. Um, at the moment, the overriding philosophy in correction centers is the approach is the first priority is the security and good order of the prison. And what we would want in a, in a prison that is rights respecting and provides humane conditions of confinement is a philosophy that is really focused around the individual and the characteristics and the support needs of each individual once they enter prison. Um, focused from a disability perspective, particularly around reasonable accommodations and supporting their needs. Um, while it's a prison sentence, it is still the duty and obligation of the state to provide humane conditions. And this would include support services. This would include, you know, providing access to programs, mental health care, um, really grounded in a recovery-based approach and a person-centered approach based in human rights. I would say those are the three, you know, key aspects of what a philosophy of a prison should be, focused obviously on rehabilitation um, instead of just a punitive approach. Um, that would be, I would say, the main um, philosophy. Are there any international protocols or guidelines which would inform such an approach? To my knowledge, there isn't an internationally agreed philosophy on corrections, um, other than the fact that there should be preventative measures. So people only come to prison as a last resort. Um, they are provided access to, you know, appeals processes, um, due, due process, um, and access to justice before they reach prison. Um, and of course, in terms of uh, prison, it's really should be focused on rehabilitation so that people, once their sentence is finished, they can fully integrate society again. Unfortunately, in practice, um, there's no country in the world that I know of where this is being done successfully, particularly from the perspective of prisoners with disabilities. And in your particular role at Human Rights Watch, you look at many issues from a global perspective. That's right. Ms. Kilroy, can I ask the initial question to you as well? Yes, thank you. Um, I think fundamentally, um, first and foremost, we have to work to decarcerate and abolish children's prisons as a matter of urgency. And that's happening in Hawaii right now. Um, in regards to a philosophy, I would suggest that it needs to be a values-based uh, driven philosophy where human rights principles and conventions, um, human rights conventions need to be articulated within that philosophy so that decarceration is clear, working towards fi the final abolition of youth prisons. 
You mentioned Hawaii. You've recently been in Hawaii. Did you pick up any information relevant to this question in your time there? Yes, so in Hawaii, what's happened in the last decade, the administrator of the Hawaiian Youth Correctional Facility and judges and community and the University of Hawaii and the Vance Institute of the USA have worked together to actually decarcerate um, where no children will be in a youth prison again. So presently there's no girls there and there hasn't been for a number of months and there's 16 boys. The prison has now been renamed and um, all the, the buildings on the prison um, property have been recommissioned and repurposed for Indigenous organisations to work and support the children. So whether it's transitional housing, mental health, drug and alcohol, employment training. Um, and there's also an organic farm, five acres of organic farm where the children work. So it's very much driven by the Indigenous um, Hawaiian people's principles of how to work with their children long term. So it's not just about someone coming into a prison, having a program as a quick fix, and then being released back into the same situation. It's about that ongoing support prior where legislation, certain offences have been decriminalised and also um, at the back end for post-release support so that they are secured in accommodation, get employment and get on with their lives. Can I pause there? I should have said to each of you as panellists that these proceedings are utilising the services of Auslan interpreters so that the wider public can follow. Can I ask each of you to try and mm -hmm. slow down in your answers um, as the chair will tell you, it's not a personal criticism. Um, most witnesses are, are prone to speaking very quickly. So if you could each keep that in mind, um, I will be popular with the Ausland interpreters. I apologise, I sp speak fast. <laughs> Mr Newhouse. M Mr Griffin, can I just ask, sorry, can I just ask, decarceration, that's a, a very broad concept, and as you know, this is the Disability Royal Commission. What one or two specific thing that you suggest to us to um, in relation to disability yes, in terms so, of decarceration? Okay, so Sisters and Sires are very much a values-based driven organisation as an abolitionist organisation. So everything we do, I'm speaking fast again, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> is, de is based from decarceration. So what that actually means is we will work with, for example, the children of women who are in prison or the girls that are in the youth prison um, so that they, if they have been criminalised, that, that we can keep them out of prison. So we work, for example, in the watch house with all the girls and to support them for bail applications. And then when they have uh, bail approved, that they comply with those conditions. And when it's time for them to go to court and if they plead guilty to that offence, that um, we provide documentation or um, professional reports to the court for their sentencing so that they don't end up um, back inside the, the youth prison. So it's about working to it, at all stages of the spectrum of criminalisation to one, children not be criminalised. If they are, how do we get them out in the first instance and keep them out? If they're in prison, how do we get them out? Like, so that could be a bail application in the Children's Court of Queensland if they've been refused in the Children's Court, and then when they're released to ensure that they have accommodation and all the other services that um, are required for them to continue on in the community. Yep. Thank you. Mr Newhouse. Yes, look, colonisation of this land uh, began as a convict settlement. And when you look at Banksia Hill, not much has changed in philosophy since then. And when you look at the current philosophy, it's brutal, it's cruel, and it's just punishment. There's, I've, I've had a lot of experience um, in, with children in Banksia Hill and in prisons in Western Australia, and there's nothing but punishment provided to any of those individuals. But when you look at um, philosophy, I'd like to pick up um, Ms. Kilroy's points, and, and I accept them and adopt them all. But I think some of the principles should be, and I, I think I'm reframing some of what she's saying, that the institution should be focused on the detainee or the prisoner and improving their health, their educational outcomes, and preparing them for life outside 
of the youth detention center or prison. That's not what's happening at the moment. And they, the centers should be transparent. Bringing in independent people will shine a light on the awful deeds that are being done in prisons. Um, these are total institutions. If you look at the Royal Commission in a Child Sexual Abuse, the same principles applied to children who were abused in the Catholic Church or uh, orphanages or institutions, those organisations protect themselves. And it's exactly the same in prisons. They run for themselves. Um, but the principle of um, uh, philosophy should also be culturally safe allow independent organisations to come in and provide services, not simply contractors of the departments who have to toady to them. Uh, they should be respectful of difference and, and, and have as a measurable goal, improvement in the lives of their charges, the people that are within the prisons. At the moment, we don't measure any of that. We don't measure the improvement in the lives of those who remain within the, the prison or youth detention system. Ms Sharma, do I take it from reading your statement that you would say people with disability should, whenever possible, be diverted from a custodial setting? Um, absolutely, but I would add a caveat to that. It depends on where they're being diverted to. Um, and I think that's really important when looking at prisoners with disabilities. Um, we cannot have a separate discriminatory or segregated system when it comes to prisoners with disabilities. We cannot have you know, people with uh, prisoners with psychosocial disabilities, mental health conditions, or cognitive disabilities being diverted to other types of institutions like forensic mental health hospitals, um, you know, or, or institutions where they do not have the same safeguards in place that a prison has. They do not have the same appeals process. They don't have the same, you know, right to lawyers. They don't have the same, um, you know, protection in terms of abuses. And that's something that I think is key when looking at diversion. Yes, diversion is critical and essential. And ideally, you know, we should not have um, this number, this high percentage of prisoners with disabilities in prison, but they should not be diverted to a discriminatory system where they may face additional and sometimes worse abuse, including forced treatment, you know, seclusion, restraints, chemical, as well as physical. Um, and so I think that is really key when looking at prisoners with disabilities. Can I ask, can, can I ask a question that might take us from uh, Hawaii, as much as I have great respect for Hawaii? Um, is there anywhere in Australia that is actually doing some of the things that each of you advocate? Where is the best model in this country within our legal, social, political structure that gives us a lead as to what we might do in order to address the problems that each of you has articulated very clearly, but as we all know, have been articulated for at least the last three decades. So everything that you've said, and this is in no way a criticism, are things that have been said for decades. Our problem is, what are we going to do about it? And how are we going to get to where we want to go? Where's the best place in this country, if there is one, to start? Can, can I possibly answer that, Commissioner? Um, I, was, I was involved in a death in custody of a 19-year-old boy in the West Australian system. Um, and his mother told me, and this is not related to his death, but he was looking forward to leaving um, the custodial system and joining a group called Yeeha. And I asked her about Yeeha, and it was um, an organization that ran, that taught young men uh, and boys to be stockmen. Well, uh, I don't know if there were women involved in this group, but um, this mother told me that um, he, her son was uh, looking forward to going there. They, they taught them these skills during the day and at night they learned, um, they did schooling. And she told me that every one of the boys that graduated from that course became um, valuable citizens with families and jobs today. And I said to her, what happened to that institution? Because I, I wanted to use it as a model. 
she told me that the West Australian government defunded it. So I don't know of any other institution that's doing anything like that, but that seemed to be a success to me. Ms. Kilroy, do you have any examples which address the Chair's question? Yes, thank you. I don't believe there's any good practice in regards to any prison, whether it's youth or adult, um, in this country. There's many uh, community organisations, NGOs, that actually provide very successful support for criminalised and imprisoned. And I'll talk about women and girls. Um, particularly, I can um, talk about two of Sisters in Size programs, the Yanga program. That's where we support the girls. Um, it's a bail support program. And um, in that Yanga program, they're all Aboriginal staff um, and that drive that, that um, program. It's been highly successful. They run culturally informed programs away on country. All the girls that have participated in that program have not been recriminalised and not re-entered the youth prison. Further, there was a program that was funded, um, and it was a, a decade ago now, it was called the Special Circumstances Court. It was a diversion court, a therapeutic court. Um, and it was funded where organisations would be participating within the court. Over three years, 297 women were referred to Sisters Inside within that program. And um, we supported them. And it was 6% of women were actually remanded in custody um, because there weren't mental health beds. It was a court that was set up for people who were homeless, who had mental health issues, um, forms of disability, intellectual disability. So it was very much targeted. However, when the new government got elected, it was defunded and it finished. So many of those women who were then um, continued their life ended up being recriminalised and back in prison. And so we saw a great spike of women with disabilities um, being remanded and sentenced back into the adult system. Did both those programs operate in the same area of Australia? In Queensland. And when do you say in respect to the second program, it was defunded or discontinued, what was the reason given for it being discontinued? Um, I believe it was um, the new government that was elected was the LNP and it was their philosophy. They had a, a hard line law and order philosophy. And um, so they defunded the Special Circumstances Court and the Murray Court at that time. Now, in respect to the Special Circumstances Court, was any independent evaluation carried out about that program prior to it being discontinued? Yes, it was. We, our program was independently evaluated. By whom? By a woman called Susie Quixley in South Australia. And in broad terms, what were the results of that evaluation? That it was highly successful. Um, that uh, what um, people call the recidivist rate um, was down because only six women were returned to prison over three years. 30% of the women that engaged in that program were First Nations women and none of them returned to prison in that three year period. Um, so it's highly successful as well as financially successful because it costs less to fund an NGO with two workers um, than it was to imprison women um, because of their disability. Is that evaluation publicly available? Yes, it is. Can you in due course let the Commission know where we can locate that? Yes. I believe it's on our website, but I can send a copy. Thank you. Ms Sharma, picking up on the Chair's question, have you got any knowledge from your research in Australia of appropriate alternatives which have actually been tried? And if so, what was the result? So part of our research was really a comparative analysis across states. Um, and there are pockets of good practice in different states, in different prisons. Um, for example, if you look at New South Wales, the Intellectual Disability Rights Service is a good model to provide access to support from the moment the person is picked up by the police to the moment the person enters prison. They, it, it's, a, it's a very good model that other states can replicate. If you look at um, you know, monitoring or oversight, Western Australia's um, Inspector of Custodial Services is a great model that other states can replicate uh, because it's independent, because it is, you know, um, reporting directly to Parliament, because it has, um, you know, adequate resources to a certain extent. Um, it's a good model for, for, for states where the inspector is located within corrective services and does not have the same ability to independently monitor. When we look at mental health services in prison, um, the community model is actually a great one 
the Australian government's own national standards for mental health services published in 2010 have been picked up and applied in other countries around the world. It's recommended even by the World Health Organization. And yet those same standards are not being applied within prisons. Um, if you compare across states in terms of you know, support and mental health services, Queensland, although it's not perfect, and you know, as, as Debbie has said, there are a number of issues with it, it is still better than Western Australia because the, the services are delivered by the Department of Health. What does that mean? It means that when a service is de delivered by the Department of Health, um, the client is the prisoner. The client is no longer corrective services. And that means that the interests and the well being of the prisoner come first before a responsibility to the prison. That's critical. Um, it means that the health department delivering services will ensure the approach is more therapeutic. There's continuity of care before and after prison. There's access to the prisoner's medical history and records, which means from day one, they know how to support the prisoner. Um, the staff are better trained. There's doctor-patient confidentiality, which today does not exist when corrective services delivers the same services. And um, I would say most importantly, the quality of care is much closer and more comparable to community standards. Although we know it can be much improved. But I would say, you know, these are the different types of, um, you know, elements that can be picked up from different states to apply a model that is more recovery oriented, which is trauma informed, um, you know, and really centered around the individual rather than the interest of the corrective services in the prison. Ms. Sharma, can I just follow up from what you've just said? Australia being a federation, in recent times when the national government has imposed some scheme, be it pink bats or school playground equipment, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work all over the country, usually at great expense. When you did your research, you were looking at each state and territory and what they were doing. Were they talking to each other about what they were doing? To a very limited extent. Um, I would say there is a, you know, there is willingness. I, I don't think this, the willingness is not there, but the focus still remains the security. So when the interest of the prison conflicts with the interest of the prisoner, security is going to take the front seat. And that means that, you know, the services are not always geared towards the person. So there is information sharing. It's not like there isn't any. Um, even when we speak to the inspectors of custodial services, you know, they are talking across states, um, but not to the extent that we would like. And I think the focus really needs to be on good practices. On a, from, on a, from a perspective of prisoners with disabilities, this has not been done enough. Um, you know, there is no recording um, of models that have worked that are then shared across corrective services and different prisons. So there's a lot of variation, even within the same state um, amongst prisons. Can that mean different jurisdictions all in their own time try and reinvent the same wheel? Mm -hmm. It's quite different. I don't think they're, you know, reinventing the same wheel across states. Um, but yeah, and I think the context is very different. You know, if you take a state like Western Australia, where you have, um, you know, a severe overrepresentation of prisoners um, who are Indigenous, Aboriginal, or Torres Strait Islander, um, if you compare just the prisons that are in the south of the state versus regional prisons um, towards the north. There are huge differences. And so I don't think, you know, they are even sharing enough information between prisons in their own state and replicating those practices enough. Um, we also see a difference between private and government run prisons. I'll come back to that in a moment. There's just one question I want to ask Mr. Newhouse, picking up on something that Ms. Kilroy said. Ms. Kilroy referred to special circumstances courts. What's your view on the effect on First Nations people being sentenced based on your knowledge of courts such as the Murray Court in Queensland and Wallamar Ballist in New South Wales as a means of diversion from custody? All right. Before I do, um, <laughs> I'd like to take Ms Sharma's point about the Department of Health a step further. Mm -hmm. um, it's my experience in New South Wales, for example, the Department of Health does get involved 
and there is a prison in, uh, sorry, a hospital inside Long Bay Prison. But there are some conflicts there and the health workers become subservient to the guards for their safety and also because of the um, militaristic style structure of a prison. But I strongly advocate for Aboriginal medical services to be allowed in, independent disability services to be allowed in, for every disabled um, prisoner to have an NDIS caseworker, uh, leaving aside funding, to advocate for that prisoner to provide appropriate services. So I accept and adopt the suggestion of Department of Health, but I would go even further. The more independent organisations and community-based organisations that are allowed into prisons to see the horrors of what's going on, it, it creates transparency and openness, and, and they can actually advocate whereas state organisations often feel like they are vassals to the organisation. Can I pick, pick up on that answer before I leave it? Based on your experience around Australia, I understand that in some states, health services within prisons are provided by the health department or an offshoot. Yes. Whilst in other states, the health services are part of corrections. Yes. In your experience, does that make a difference on the ground? Absolutely. In what way? Uh, West Australian is one, of, uh, is one of the worst systems in the provision of healthcare in, um, in, in detention or in prisons. That's because uh, it's the Department of Corrective Services that actually provides that care, not an independent department. Um, the standard of healthcare is abysmal. We see suicide after suicide. Um, I'm involved in six deaths in custody at the moment. And in my view, a lack of appropriate care is a major contributor to those deaths. Um, the, the death I mentioned earlier of the boy who was looking forward to going to Yeeha, 19 year old boy with, with rheumatic heart disease, they, they lost his file. He was waiting to see a cardiologist who could have saved his life. And he died waiting because the department uh, changed service providers and they lost his file. This is what's going on in Western Australia. It's scandalous. And in my view, Aboriginal medical services should go in immediately and provide those services to Aboriginal prisoners. An independent disability uh, organisation should be providing um, services to all prisoners and detainees with a disability. Ms. Kilray, on that topic. Yep. Look, the issue is, um, so in Queensland, corrective services used to have the health services and then um, there was advocacy around for Queensland Health to take them over, which they have, and, and Queensland Health has been running the medical services for some time. But that doesn't mean that, that it's working really well. Mm. <clears throat> the, the issue is, is that um, they're working in a prison and the good order and security of the prison is the priority. So they have to fall behind that. So if there's a lockdown, for example, then the medical staff can't go around the prison to give medication to the women, so they will miss out on their medication. If there's not a transport available to take a woman to a hospital to be treated, she won't be taken. So she'll miss her appointment, she'll miss her operation or a specialist appointment. So there's a huge issue. We have women's prisons over in Queensland where there's not even staffed 24 hours of medical people. So the main prison, the Raman Reception Prison, Prison Women's Correctional Centre, does not have medical staff after about 9pm and then again early hours in the morning. We know when the most distressing time for people and people with disabilities, because they're kept in solitary confinement usually, is the early hours in the morning when they're in their, the deepest depths of despair and loneliness. And so if you're buzzing, buzzing, and we know that, and being involved in coronal inquests where a woman is buzzing for assistance and nobody comes, that's just the reality. So what we need to do is that we need to let the prison run the prison and then every other service must be run by an external organisation. So whether it's an Aboriginal community controlled organisation or a disability organisation or whatever organisation it is, so that they have free access to move in and out of the prison, which will actually then ensure transparency and accountability. There also must be independent advocates allocated and I don't mean other women or other, other people in prison because they are allocated ad hoc now for people with disabilities. And it's quite dangerous and distressing for those. Oh, can you just, could, can we remind you just slow mm. down a little? Sorry, 
And then, Mr. Kerr, the general approach is that you speak at the rate. It's like, it's like there won't be any sanctions imposed. It just means we can actually keep a record of what you say. A good rule of thumb is to take the rate you speak at and knock 50% off it. And that will then come across as a rate that can be dealt with by everyone listening. Thank you. I don't know if I'm going to try. Mr. Kilroy, can Mr. I Griffin is, Mr. Griffin is a model and example to us all. Yeah. Speaking of model, Chair, uh, Ms. Kilroy, what would that look like in practice? What would a model for the coordination yeah. of services or uh, Mr. Newhouse and Ms. Sharma have Describe what in practice one or two key elements would it be the prison coordinating or more sort of a, a, a wider coordination mechanism? I think it needs to be a wider coordination so that we open up. If look, if the community wants prisons and we want to incarcerate people, then they must be held accountable and they must be transparent so that we need more people involved. What we've what I've experienced. Um, you know, of the last five decades of my life of being a child incarcerated in a youth prison, a woman incarcerated in an adult prison, and now the CEO of Sisters Inside and a lawyer, and watching the changes over those years, way back when in the 70s, those external organisations were coming into the prisons. Mm. And so that was already happening. But as the prison system, the industry got bigger, and expanded, um, then more funding was allocated by the government to that department of prisons or corrective services, whatever you want to call it. And then external organisations, whether they were funded organisations or volunteer organisations, were actually pushed out. And now what we have is renegotiation of contracts by corrective services usually about how you can access a prison when you can access a prison and what you can and can't do. So it's very much a surveillance carceral model where the NGO can't actually get on with their work. There was a model in Scotland where the, okay. <laughs> there was a model in Scotland, women's prison, where the superintendent left the prison gates open of that old prison back in the nineties in a little village which allowed the local bowling women to come in, which allowed you know, many volunteer organisations as well as NGOs to come in and out of the prison. And the experience was there that no one ever ran away, escaped, if you like. And if a woman did escape, it was because usually of what was happening to her children in the community and she was concerned. So um, it's about working from a position of being humane and respectful to other human beings. And like I said, if we want prisons, which I don't, um, we actually need to treat people with respect and dignity and as individuals, not a one size fit all, because it doesn't work. It fails us and we will continue to have another Royal Commission in another decade and we'll be repeating ourselves again. Right, we might give Mr. Griffin a chance to ask a question now. And I'd like, can I just add to if that? I, and go ahead, Josh. You go. Well, very quickly, <laughs> um, I acted for Cornelia Rao in 2005. Mm -hmm. One of the recommendations of the Palmer Report, because she was incarcerated with a serious mental illness, and I'm not revealing anything that isn't in mm -hmm. the report. The recommendation there was for an independent medical and health oversight committee separate from the Department of Immigration. And that, and that was a very effective mechanism for holding them accountable. And I strongly recommend it. Can I just pick up on a question I asked some time ago, and Mr. Newhouse, for your response. <laughs> I referred to the special circumstances court, Ms. Kilroy referred to, and I asked you whether, on your view, First Nations sentencing courts, such as the Murray Court in Queensland and the Wallamar list in New South Wales uh, an effective means of diverting people from the criminal justice system. Yes, and the Koori Court in Victoria. These are mechanisms that are being used on the East Coast very successfully to um, involve the community, to ensure that um, there is a rehabilitative approach and yet hold young people accountable in some ways for what they've 
done. So, uh, and some of, some of the courts are involved with adults as well. But I strongly uh, recommend those processes and there's something that should be looked at across the nation. I'd now like to move to the situation with detention centres and prisons where the person is going into those environments. And we've heard evidence this week about what would be appropriate screening and assessment of people when they go into custody. Can I go back to you, Ms. Sharma? Have you looked at the question of screening and assessment? We have, um, and you know, what we find is the problem really starts with the lack of proper assessment. Without identification of disability upon entry into prison, the person cannot be supported once they go in. Um, and this is the kind of critical information that you would think corrective services regularly you know collects but if you ask states you know we've done this with queensland and um, western australia they do not have any disability disaggregated data they do not have a sense of how many people with disabilities which types of disabilities are in their prison so to be able to support them and have a sense of their support needs is a far cry um, today disability identification relies heavily on self-reporting which is inadequate um, since many prisoners are not aware of their disability, do not identify as having one, have never been diagnosed prior to entering prison, or hesitate to even disclose it because of stigma. And the problem really lies in the training of prison staff. Our investigation found that the staff do not have the time, training, or tools to identify people with disabilities and their support needs. The training that prison staff get today um, they have a small component of a disability and a mental health training, but there are no refresher and ongoing courses, and these courses are not meaningful. Um, they do not give the, uh, the, the staff um, adequate information, awareness, and knowledge to really engage and support people with disabilities. Um, and this is you know, this was told to us by corrective services staff. Um, this was told to us by prisoners across the spectrum um, that this is not being done. Because of this, what happens is the consequences are very serious. Due to the lack of training, custodial staff then fail to recognize behavior associated with a disability and therefore misinterpret a person's behavior as defiance or disobedience. They think they are quote unquote acting up. And as a result, their responsive instead of supporting the person can be punitive. Um, we documented a number of, of, of instances where the person, you know, had acted in a behavior which was resulted from a disability, which was really a cry for help. And instead of supporting them, they were punished. They were sent to detention units or segregated. Um, and this really leads to an overuse and disproportionate use of solitary confinement on prisoners with psychosocial and cognitive disabilities, which I'll is back to that extremely issue damaging. In a moment. <clears throat> But I want to concentrate on the screening and assessment. It's obviously difficult for anybody to carry out that task if the person doesn't divulge relevant information to them. You would accept that, wouldn't you? To an extent, yes. Yes. Who should carry out the screening and what information do they need to do it adequately? The assessment. Yes. You know, if we're talking within the corrective services context, the assessment is preferably to be carried out by the health um, department, which is hopefully the same provider as in the community. Second, they need support and training from disability rights organizations, from people who are working in disability services externally. Um, and I would say, you know, if you look, for example, at mental health conditions, um, especially when it comes to Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander prisoners, there is a model, you know, the Mental Health Act, for example, provides an option where the mental health assessment can be of a person who is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander can be conducted in collaboration with First Nation health workers or significant members of the person's community, including elders and traditional healers. So that model is there under the Mental Health Act, um, but it isn't applied in prison, and that's the problem. Ms. Kilroy, can I put the same question to you? Screening and assessment, who does it? What information do they need to do it adequately? I think um, the step before someone being um, 
sentenced to prison, that that assessment needs to be done um, within the community or directed by the courts. So the majority of people who end up in prison are sentenced from like a magistrate's low level for courts. They do the bulk um, of the matters. However, legal aid doesn't fund those specific expert reports, where if people are sentenced in the higher court, district court, Supreme Court, um, or they're equal, um, you can apply for a um, professional report to be undertaken. And then the court will recommend an order that that report follows the person into prison and it would have recommendations from that expert about what needs to impl be implemented. We actually see um, all the time, particularly those reports that are ordered, for example, from the Supreme Court, um, that they're not necessarily sent to the prison in adequate time or the prison can't find them because I have the prison ringing me asking me to send the, the report because the woman's saying I've got a report and I have to do these specific programs or um, you know, get assessed further and the prison won't act on it. That report also needs to follow the woman too to the parole board so that everyone has the same information across the board. Um, what we see, it's very um, silo and ad hoc and um, the prison system starts from scratch every time. If Mary comes in, even though Mary's been there before, they will treat her as a clean slate and then have to reassess her again within whatever terms they do, and it's usually by a nurse. And when I talk about that external services need to be funded and not have the prison do that, mm -hmm. you need to have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander practitioners assessing the women in the first instance at induction. And the women will know very quickly that that external organisation is there and that they are credible and they are supportive and they hold their information in confidence. So the women will disclose. The fear of women disclosing at that induction time, and it's the same in police watch houses when I ask the questions, is fear of being put in solitary confinement if they say, they have sort of some type of disability. And that's the concern because that's how the prison deals with people with disabilities. If they're different, not able-bodied, then they'll be put in isolation. Can I just- I think we just that? might give Mr. Griffin a chance to ask another question now before we run out of time. Um, just to clarify one thing, the non-funding of expert reports is based on your experience in Queensland. Yes, correct. Because it does vary from state to state. Yes. Uh, and just to add to that, there are young men uh, in youth detention in WA today who speak an Aboriginal dialect that no one in Perth understands, certainly no one in Banksia Hill. How are you going to assess them? Um, and the, the, the assessments are complex. They need to be culturally safe, uh, no matter what group they come from. But also, I think it's really important to look at education as well. We shouldn't just be assessing uh, people's disabilities. Which it's, it's a critical issue, mm. but so is their education. Most of the prisoners and, and detainees that I see are illiterate. They are, they are not given any educational opportunities. There's no assessment of their baseline. There's no assessment of what they need in detention or, or in prison. In youth detention, they get thrown a, a scrapbook and told colour in or work on this yourself. Half of them can't even read and no one's assessed them. So this assessment process ne needs to be with occupational therapists, teachers, uh, psychologists, and culturally safe practitioners. A holistic response. Correct. Panelists, I want to move on to another discrete issue which has become the subject of evidence in this inquiry, and that's the use of isolation or confinement once someone is in a prison or in a youth detention centre. Can I start with you, Ms Sharma? In your statement, I think your ultimate recommendation is that the option of isolation should be illegal. Is that correct? The option of solitary confinement on people with disabilities, yes. not isolation. Yeah. Yes. In those circumstances, what happens if those running one of these places has an inmate or a detainee 
that is behaving in a way which might be putting at risk the staff or other inmates. If you make it illegal to isolate somebody, what are your options? So we're not saying that it's illegal to isolate someone. That is something that prisons do regularly for different purposes. Oh, but what I thought, your, recommend, I thought is, your recommendation was that that should be illegal. So not, not isolation, solitary confinement should be. Solitary confinement. Which means that being locked up in a cell for 22 hours or more a day without meaningful human contact. That means only contact with guards does not count as meaningful contact. Um, and when this goes in excess of 15 days, it becomes prolonged solitary. So what we are calling for is for state and territory governments to ban the practice on prisoners with disabilities, because we find that today it's being overused, disproportionately used to punish, manage, but also ostensibly to protect or keep prisoners alive. And this is something that is extremely damaging to prisoners with disabilities. So what the prison can do in these situations, um, the solution would be one to ban it in legislation, including isolation, you know, use of solitary confinement, um, as well as isolation or behavioral management techniques that amount to it. And the way to, to, to solve, um, you know, the, the, this issue, if someone is in crisis, what do you do? Um, what we're talking about is we are saying that prisons can come to a decision um, where segregation of a person is necessary for a general, you know, from the general prison population as a disciplinary sanction, but it should not amount to solitary confinement, which means they should receive at least 20 hours a week of out of cell time. They should get access to mental health services. They should get access to activities, including mental health programs, and really have human contact with other individuals, without which it's extremely damaging. And there's a lot of research internationally, including in Australia, which finds it has long-term impacts. What can the staff do instead? Um, the staff should really be trained um, in de-escalation techniques. That would mean a prompt assessment and intervention in cases in crisis, using problem solving methods with the person concerned, um, being empathetic and reassuring, using stress management or relaxation techniques such as breathing exercises, giving the person space, offering the person choice, giving the person time to think. These are all de-escalation techniques that are routinely used um, and are very effective but are not being done in prisons. Um, so it's, it's something that you know, international legislation is very clear on um, under the UN Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the Convention Against Torture, the Co Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Keeping prisoners with disabilities in solitary confinement amounts to torture. It is something that should not be taking place. Experts on torture, the subcommittee on torture, the minimum standard um, of rules for the treatment of prisoners all say that it should be prohibited. Doing this is inhumane and should not be legal across Australia. Can we move from the, can we move from, and I don't underestimate the force of propositions that we find in international human rights instruments and the objectives we're trying to achieve. How do we get there? I mean, what are the practical suggestions for doing the things? I mean, of course, yes, you want a, a, a process that allows for all these supports, individual support, but within, a, within the prison systems of the kind we have now, you're not going to retrain wardens, for example, to perform the kind of functions you're talking about, I don't think. So how are we going to do it? Can we use the NDIS, for example? Why can't we use the NDIS? Almost every not every, many of the people that we've been talking about at this hearing will be people who are either on the NDIS or are eligible for it. They just haven't got there yet because they don't know how to, no one's helping them to or whatever. We have to find a way, don't we, of bringing into these systems the expertise, the people who've got the skills you're talking about, and it's a very difficult task because it has to be grafted onto a punitive system, one that's been entrenched for centuries. Okay, what are the mechanisms we can use? Well, surely the NDIS is one of them. What yes. other things can we use? Can I suggest Mr. Mr. Newhouse, Newhouse? Yes. Yeah. might take that question, Chair. Right. Um, I agree with you, Commissioner. You can't train prejudice and culture out of people in, in, in a day. It will take time. I think there needs to be law reform. 
If you look at the recent case in WA, uh, where the Supreme Court uh, declared, made a declaration that holding children in solitary confinement was unlawful, that would be a good start. The uh, inspector uh, of, of uh, custodial, custodial services. services in WA has been saying this for years. It's in his reports and he does a, it does a great job, but this government is not listening and they need to act. So law reform is necessary to outlaw the form of solitary confinement that Ms Kilroy has been talking about. Um, people can't complain in prison. If they do complain, they get punished by guards. So there needs to be a secret mechanism or, or one that's holistic amongst the whole cohort so that punitive action and victimization and retribution can't be meted out to prisoners or inmates who complain. Spit hoods must be banned, strip searches outlawed. If you've been sexually assaulted, can you, as a, particularly as a child, can you imagine the impact that strip searching has on you? Um, transparency is essential, uh, Commissioner. Uh, every time we go to take action on a complaint, guess what? There's no video evidence. In Western Australia, they'll tell you, oh, we, we, we record over it every 30 days, right? That's the, that's the, the situation. Um, guards cover up uh, cameras whenever they're, they're about to assault someone. There needs to be CCTV footage running in all public areas, 24 hours a day with live streaming into the inspector's offices. And, and the video footage, you can laugh, you can laugh. And that footage needs to be kept for five years so that these young vulnerable people can actually um, have um, some accountability. When guards go into cells, they need body cams um, and there should be audio as well. And you can laugh, but this is a very serious point. NDIS and Medicare end at the gates of prisons and youth detention centres. They need, to, those, both those services need to be funded. And I agree with you, Commissioner, having a, uh, an, a, a, a caseworker, an NDIS caseworker who can actually advocate for you would have helped the witness yesterday, I believe, and would help all uh, prisoners and detainees with, with um, a disability. Can I raise another issue? It's quite controversial. Coroners in many states have been charged with investigating deaths in custody for 30 years since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, and many are not doing their job. Ms Kilroy and I discuss this regularly. There are coroners who will only look at the immediate cause of death of an individual. Quite often, it's related to a lack of medical service or racism or discrimination. They refuse um, in many states, in particular, I'll name Queensland and Western Australia, some in Queensland, but um, Western Australia is particularly bad. They refuse to look at the systemic problems within prisons and carceral um, areas. And you should not be doing this job. We should not be having to expose this kind of problem at a, at a once in a generation uh, com Royal Commission. Coroners should be doing this job every time they have to look at a death in custody. Um, and, I, and I come back to my point earlier that the focus of prisons and youth detention centres should be the individual. At the moment, they run around the institution. If you start setting key performance indicators based on the plans that the individuals receive when they go in, the assessments, let's measure the improvement in those uh, the, the, the individual throughout their journey. If you're not measuring it, it's not happening. So um, I've spoken- Can I just pause, pause there, Mr. Nick? Yes. The Chair, I want I note the time. I want to give Ms Kilroy an opportunity to make any comment, given the fact that she's the panel member who's been in prison. Certainly, yes. I'm... And and then I want to give... We're, not, we're not going anywhere, as far as I know. Oh, well, Mr. Mr Newhouse has to leave. But, but um, And I also want to give the oh. Commissioners an opportunity to ask any questions, even if that means coming back to me if we've got more time after. But, Ms Kilroy, you've had the most first-hand experience of things such as solitary confinement and how things operate. What's it all taught you? As a child that was kept in solitary confinement um, for the majority of my time, 
and I still carry that trauma. It was the most horrific experience, the most degrading, traumatizing experience. And the most tragic thing about us as human beings is that we continue to put children and adults in solitary confinement. We continue to use other carceral mechanisms that cause trauma as well within the, within the cell of when you're in solitary confinement. So strip searching, the use of restraints, chemical and, me me and mechanical restraints, spit hoods. Spit hoods are used more on women with disability than any other cohort in the prison system. And that's because corrective services say we are more emotional. So it's not because we're more violent. I think the, uh, the chair asked a question about behaviours. Behaviour is reactional. If you are treated badly, you will react badly. We must abolish all those forms of restraints and trauma and torture because they are already recognised universally as cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment. So they must be abolished. We must abolish solitary confinement, strip searching, mechanical, chemical restraints and spit hoods because the end result <clears throat> for many is not only deaths in prison, but on release deaths in the community. As I indicated, Chair, I'd like to give commissioners the opportunity at this point to ask any questions given the yeah, time. Can, uh, can I say, if, if Mr Newhouse has to leave, uh, uh, that's fine. We won't take it amiss if you leave. We can continue for another few minutes. So it's entirely a matter for you. I'm happy to wait a few more minutes, but please excuse me if I can. Yeah, well, if, if, when you need to leave, feel, uh, feel free to do so, even if we're continuing. Uh, yes, well, what I might do now is ask the commissioners if they have any questions for you, and I shall commence with uh, Commissioner Mason. Do you have any questions for any member of the panel or for the panel as a whole? Um, I do have one question, Chair, um, and um, so we've, we've heard today and in this, um, in this session of evidence around uh, these, these solutions, um, these strategies being talked about for decades and particularly since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Um, I just have a simple question, might not be a simple answer, um, and if it's not a simple answer, then, then let, I'll leave that for others to say. But, but who decides on these changes? Who, who, who makes that ultimate decision, particularly, for example, here in Western Australia, of these recommendations of this case for change? But at the end of the day, who decides in Western Australia? I think the simple answer is that um, governments in power make the decisions to change. And we have successional governments that roll over and over again of the same two really political parties that really have no courage to stand up for children and people that are criminalised and imprisoned. And it's time that we prioritise human beings and their treatment over property. We live in a racial capitalist world that prioritises property over people and that must end. Otherwise, we're just going to be keep repeating the cycle for decades to come. I think there's an opportunity that might come out of this Royal Commission for the federal government to get involved. If we're talking about having NDIS and Medicare access to prisoners, that's money and that's something that the federal government could do to bring the states and territories together. There is no effective coordination. Everyone in every state gets to make their, the leaders of government in each state make their own and territory make their own decisions. I think the federal government has a role to play in improving the lot of disabled people in detention and uh, in prisons. Well, in the two areas we're particularly concerned with that intersect here, that is First Nations people and then people with disability, both of those areas are plainly areas that the Commonwealth has legislative power that chooses to exercise. There are, of course, delicate questions of federal-state relations and the complications of our criminal justice system 
that includes a federal criminal justice system and state-run uh, penal institutions and so on all has to be taken into account. But there's no doubt about the power of the federal government uh, and federal parliament more accurately uh, to uh, uh, contribute constructively to this area. That may be a matter of political will or judgment in particular cases. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McEwen. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all three of you for your evidence. Uh, some of you have said that more training is necessary, and we've heard that constantly through this Royal Commission. Can any of you point me to any evidence or research that actually shows that more training has been effective in changing culture, behaviour, empathy, it's a very long list. I'd like to know, is there any evidence out there that training alone has resulted in systemic change and the ones that we're talking about here at this Royal Commission for, for uh, Disabled People? And I'll direct that to any of you. Like Ms. Sharma, maybe, in a position to answer. Sure. Um, I think if you look at the World Health Organization, they have an initiative called the Quality Rights Initiative, um, which targets, you know, particularly looking at mental health, um, you know, changing attitudes around mental health, eliminating coercion from mental health. It's a program that has worked. Um, there's a lot of evidence of it having worked across 31 countries currently around the world. Um, it's a program where we see attitudinal change on mental health. We see, you know, recovery based approaches, um, attention to human rights, all resulting purely from this program. Um, currently, the WHO is offering it free. Prison staff can do it online. It's you know it's accessible virtually, and we would also be happy to facilitate you know um, assistance from the WHO with corrective services with state governments, and it's something that can be easily rolled out. Now, training alone is not going to change the whole landscape, but training is a very important part of it. Um, and I would you know second what uh, Debbie and George raised in terms of bringing community organizations into prisons, increasing partnerships with Aboriginal organizations to deliver services in prison with disability organizations, um, and really engaging in a comprehensive way. What this means for the state, it doesn't have to be a resource intensive recommendation. It means diverting resources that are currently going into prisons, currently going exclusively into corrective services, to more community-based interventions for them to enter prison and provide services to prisoners. So I would say there is evidence and it can be applied quite easily, I would say, to corrective services. Can I add to that? Um, both Ms. Uh, Ms. Kilroy and I work with um, a critical race theorist, uh, Chelsea Wadigo, Professor Chelsea Wadigo in Queensland. She she's of the view, training is important and I'm not, dismissing anything that Ms. Sharma said, but you can't train away racism and prejudice against people with disability. You need accountability and transparency, right? Without that, and account of, if you don't hold people accountable for their abuses, which is why I suggested CCTV, because that's the only defense that some of these people have against the abuses of their guards, you will not see change. You need law reform to ban um, solitary confinement for the good order of the of the institution. I've seen boys locked up in solitary for 300 days or more for the good order of the youth detention centre. Now, unless that's outlawed legislatively, unless people are held accountable, the people that did that got promoted or moved to other sections of, of the um, public service. Uh, until that happens, you won't see cultural change in my view. I would just second that and to say that the Royal Commission really has a unique opportunity. If that's included in your recommendations, we really can push for change on the ground and yeah, it could be groundbreaking. Yeah. If that's something the Royal Commission could recommend. And if I could just, uh, one thing I'd like to contribute is um, training education is really important. However, it's like police. Prison officers have been, there's been so many resources thrown at them and we still have the same result. 
Where we need to focus is on education and training for people who are actually incarcerated. Um, what we have in Queensland is the policy is jobs, jobs, jobs for people in prison to get employed when they're released. But if they don't have the capacity or the education to be able to do that, they're never going to get a job. When I was in prison and it was at a win last in prison and the window of reform was about education, education, education. And it was also a policy of uh, the prison system at that time that any staff who worked in there had to have a tertiary education. So there was a prison officer that started a university degree the same day or well, the same year that I started my social work degree. After about six months, that policy was disbanded for prison staff. She never finished it. I continued on and did a law degree as well as a master's in law. She still works as a prison officer. Mm. And so we need, the resources must go to people who are in prison. Staff need some training, obviously, but let's focus on those that are actually in the cages and educate them at whatever level that must be so they can walk out. Because we all know in this room that education gives us so many more choices in life. Um, well, thank you. And also thank you to all of you for the work that you're doing in the justice sector. Thank you. Thank you. There's one issue, the Chair, I wish to clarify to each of the witnesses. Yes. The general view seems to be the responsibility of a corrections department is to maintain good order, to confine the people for a period of time, to protect their staff. We've spoken about community organisations having access to prisons for various reasons, understand. Mm -hmm. What about other organs of the state, the Department of Health, Department of Housing, Department of Education? In your view, do they have a role or are they, to use my word, similarly tainted by lack of independence from corrections? Ms. Kilroy. Um, yes, of course they have a role, absolutely, where we know um, one of the most fundamental issues of why people with disability end up criminalised in prison is because of homelessness. So, of course, Department of Housing must be involved to actually secure housing, because if I believe if they had housing in the first instance, stable, safe housing, they wouldn't be criminalised um, while homeless. So um, there's absolutely... But the thing, the problem with departments is they act as silos. And so... Someone in a department may be providing a particular service, say housing, and you have a housing application in, if you go to prison, it's suspended. So you're not moving up the list of priority housing. So when you're released, you've got to start again. You know, and federally, if you're on a disability support pension and you're in prison for longer than 13 weeks, it ends. Your NDIS package, if it comes up for review, and if the prison doesn't undertake and ensure that review happens, you lose your funding. So when you're, so, and we have women that are being held in prison that can't get accommodation because they no longer have the NDIS funding and because parole can't assess somewhere where they can live. So there's all that complication. So of course, all those departments do play a huge role, but they seem to stay in their lane <laughs> um, once someone goes to prison and not, actually keep, continue the service. Can I add to that? And then I will go. Um, I, I think you've raised a really good point. All those dep departments have a role to play in assisting the individual, but they need to be coordinated by an independent caseworker. You see this model, I know it's working in New South Wales, I think it's national now, in the health justice partnerships. So a lawyer um, is um, allocated to a hospital, emergency ward, homeless people arrives in a, in a, in a uh, hospital ward, and they receive a coordinated response uh, from the Department of um, Housing, from a medical uh, aspect, from their legal aspects. Uh, and that's the kind of coordinated response that the individual needs in prison or youth detention. And it's a great suggestion that all these departments need to be involved. It's not that they're compromised by being organs of the state, but they need to be harnessed together. Otherwise you do get the silos that Ms Kilroy's talking about. Ms Sharma, does your research uh, support the proposition put by Mr Newhouse? We can't hear you. She's thinking. 
sorry, I would agree, um, you know, that they definitely have a role to play and there needs to be coordination. And it really needs to have an integrated approach. You know, as Debbie was saying, um, your NDIS benefits can get suspended, your housing gets applications get suspended. And that means that once you are released, you are more likely in many cases, especially with people with disabilities, to reoffend or you know, commit another crime. Very often, prisoners told us themselves to just get back in and have housing and to have access to food. And we should not be a society where you know, recidivism occurs because we are not supporting them on the day people get out of prison. That, that's not really how a rehabilitative system should work. Final question I want to address to you, Ms. Sharma, and to Ms. Kilroy, in light of the Chair's observation that we're working in a real world where you have to try and graft onto a long-term system suggested changes. From a practical point of view, if you had to nominate one or two things that we could do tomorrow, what would it be, Ms. Kilroy? Um, it may not get done by tomorrow <laughs> because it needs some political will, but to legislate um, to end any forms of solitary confinement and any of those other mechanisms that I talked about, spit hoods, chemical, mechanical strain and strip searching will make a huge impact on people's lives in prison because they're not experiencing that violence on a daily basis and presumably make an impact to their post-prison life as well, exactly. if they're spared that experience. Yes. And more so, if we look to the front end, the other would be to look at the um, programs that actually work. So I spoke about the Special Circumstances Court, for example, and that's a model that could be operate across the country in all jurisdictions as a thera therapeutic jurisdictional court. Um, and that it's funded and ongoing, but not cyclic with political periods of government. Ms Sharma, what would be your wish list of immediate change? I would second what you know, Debbie just said, um, prohibiting solitary confinement for people with disabilities. And it is possible, uh, both in legislation and policy. The second thing I would say, um, which is vital um, and practically can be done, is really reforming mental health services in prison. Um, as I said, for them to be delivered by the Department of Health, um, having robust one-to-one -one peer support programs by and for people with lived experience, which are implemented in close collaboration with Aboriginal-led organizations and Aboriginal health services to ensure they're culturally co competent including developing a strategy of engagement with family and friends um, and providing, you know, connecting with support networks for the prisoner so that reduces the risk of self-harm and suicide. We need to have more staff that are First Nations people in mental health teams servicing prisons. Um, there needs to be an increased partnership with Aboriginal community-based organizations to deliver services in prison. Um, we need to ensure prison and mental health staff receive, as I said, the free WHO training on quality rights. Um, and we need to ensure, you know, as has been said before, and as Megan said very well in her testimony earlier today, mental health services need to be comprehensive as opposed to simply prescribing medication. There needs to be one-on-one -on -one counseling by trained professionals. Needs to be, you know, support Ms. provided, Ms. Sharma, early you, intervention. Ms. Sharma. We lost your audio for about 10 seconds. I wonder if you can just recap on what you said recently. Sure. Um, the last point I was making was that mental health services need to be comprehensive as opposed to simply prescribing them. It needs to include individual one-on-one -on -one counseling by trained professionals. It needs to happen in a timely manner without having to wait weeks or months. There needs to be early intervention and support from the day the person enters prison with regular follow-up. Um, and it needs to be delivered by mental health professionals from outside corrective services. So opposed to trying to hide that information and trying to you know, hide the fact that they have the disability in the first place. So these are two recommendations I would say can definitely very practically be implemented 
um, quite quickly, and I would really call on the Royal Commission to include them in their recommendations. And the last would be to age, to have a recommendation to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to at least 14 years of age. On what basis do you make that recommendation? There has been evidence that has already been presented in front of the Royal Commission on that, you know, as Debbie talked about, you know, the, the, the trauma, um, the abuses that we see in youth, uh, youth detention, the traumatizing impact it can have, the fact that a child at that age has not, um, does not have the, the development physically and mentally to have the same responsibility that, that, that our elder has variety of reasons why this should be the case. And I would also refer you to our reports, um, which are in evidence, which provide more detail on this. Shama, the same might apply to young men in certain situations, but I'll leave that today. Chair, they're my questions for the panelists. Yes, thank you very much indeed, um, Ms. Kilroy, uh, Ms. Sharma, and uh, Mr. Newhouse in absentia for the very uh, detailed written statements you have provided and the very thoughtful comments we've heard uh, this afternoon. There has been uh, a uh, very, this has been a very useful discussion with a uh, rich blend of ideas for us uh, to uh, consider. And we're very grateful to you for the thought uh, that has gone into uh, your contributions to the Royal Commission. So thank you very much, Ms. Sharma. Continue to uh, enjoy uh, Mauritius, Ms. Kilroy. Enjoy Perth and uh, Mr. Newhouse, he can enjoy wherever he's gone off to. <laughs> Chair, I now. also, sorry, if I could apologise for speaking um, so fast and I will take that that's quite. That, that's quite, Ms. Kilroy, you don't need to apologise. You are in a long line of people in this Royal Commission who have spoken too fast and it's not confined to witnesses, I should say. So you have no need to apologise whatsoever. Now, tomorrow is a public holiday, uh, a day designated as mourning for the late Queen Elizabeth II. That means that we will not be sitting uh, as a Royal Commission tomorrow. We will, however, be resuming on Friday, and I take it Mr Griffin will be resuming at 9am. We will. Thank you, Chair. And Ms Wright of Senior Council will be taking the first witnesses. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. So we'll adjourn until 9am on Friday. Thank you, everybody. The Royal thank Commission you. is now adjourned.